Cory to his channel Blythe Lewis. So once again it's time to go far beyond the world. Or are we? It takes a while for the reality of it all to sink in. I struggle to grasp all of what's happening, but eventually I gather the strength to move. Despite the window being cracked open, the obvious breeze ruffling the curtains, the air is oddly heavy. My legs, as she indicated, feel rather funny. I have to pay extra attention with each step. I slowly approach the desk, pushing away a bundle of weighted balloons. There I find my change of clothes folded neatly on the chair. Only now it appears to me to actually check what I'm wearing. It's a dark blue pyjama set with a bunch of full moons and stylized wolves howling at them. I pull up the top ever so slightly as to uncover my abdomen. The scar I've stabbed is replaced with stitches. Was... was I operated on? I feel so confused. I look at the desk, trading an assortment of different wishing cards, picking up a few at random. Get well, we miss you loads. Yours, V. Can't wait to see you again. You're the best. XXX, Cora. What? Are those meant to be my friends? There's so many things I need to tell you. I hope I'll get another chance. From the looks of it, I have at least a dozen, each card more elaborate and heartfelt than the other. Was it really all just a dream? It couldn't have. No, it doesn't feel right. My heart begins to race in desperation, and I quickly look to the shelves for answers. There's a teddy bear with a green plaid bow next to an action figure. I pick up the plastic warrior, carefully inspecting the details. He's uncomfortably reminiscent of Rannoch, almost as if he were his blueprint. There's even a dandelion and a Celtic knot badge stuck to the corkboard. A cold shiver shoots down my spine, and the horror of it all begins to sink in made it all up. All of it. Oh God, this is too cruel. I cover my trembling lips, now flanked by two warm streams of tears. I feel numb and hollow, my heavy chest slowing my breath to a near standstill. I've met someone I love and care about, only to have it be my own delusion. Most likely fueled by some fucking game. I cast my hateful gaze towards the stack of different titles and grab a few. Medieval Knight, Werewolf, The Full Moon, Dating Simulator. It all makes sense. But as I shuffle the boxes with growing panic, a slither of memory pierces through the darkness. I open one of the plastic lids and narrow my eyes in confusion. It's a CD. When I think of games, I think of CDs, but... I can't remember the last time anyone used one. I blink away the tears, my mouth slightly opened in shock as I look towards the upper shelves. A globe and some class books. Geography 2, Algebra, Biology. I chuckle at the realisation that those are school textbooks, not college ones, but high school at best. Why would I have those? But above it all on a place of honour, a generic first place trophy overlooks the room. I strain my sore muscles to reach up for it, but eventually I have it in my grasp and I bring it down for a closer inspection. First place for the excellence in sports. What sports? I was athletically inclined as a couch potato. My eyes instinctively venture towards the leather glove with a ball nestled inside of it. Does it say I play baseball? I shake my head in disbelief and put the cup down onto the desk, brushing the chair out of my way. If anything can clear this up, it's definitely the computer. I press the power button, and to my surprise it starts making the most unexpected sound. A bunch of beeps preceded by mechanical screeching and hissing noises. Is that a dial-up tone? For just saying this cannot get any more absurd, the screen goes full-on matrix on me. Lines of green gibberish flood the display from top to bottom. The computer won't be of any help. Sam, hurry up and change, dear. I look towards the door, where the woman posing as my mom calls from. 
Reluctantly, I reached the clothes she prepared, but still traced the corkboard for answers. It's a post-it note with no clear date. Friday, Bestie's birthday. Remember to bring a gift. Is that meant to be my handwriting? What sort of maniac would leave a note like that? Also, if I needed a reminder, I'd set it up on my... mobile phone. I... I know mobile phones. I nearly exclaim in excitement. I had one, I'm sure. I might not remember owning one, but I'm absolutely certain they are a thing, and the majority of people can get by without one. This shit is ancient. I nearly laugh at the ridiculous desktop I'm presented with. At first glance, that's exactly what a picture of someone asked me what a computer looks like. But I know they're no longer, well, this. I look towards the two Polaroids pinned in place as I put my pants on. Hello, bestie. I mutter cynically, rubbing my face for any remaining tears and giving a contemptuous look towards the bland youth next to me on a generic beach day photo. Then my eyes wandered my holiday memento. Eiffel Tower. Of course I'd be in France. If you think of a random posh holiday abroad, where else would you be? Well, that or Rome, I suppose. But as I button up the top of my shirt, I can't help but laugh at the medal. I gently put it away from the board and inspect both sides. First place again. This one for being the best. Of course. But the biggest killer is the acceptance letter. Apparently, I got into Harvard. Lucky me. I roll my eyes unenthusiastically. This is some wannabe wish fulfilment. It's even an express train ticket to get to Boston from wherever this is. Which is fuck knows where, because upon closer inspection, the ticket is valid from any station. Smooth. I think I spoke too soon on what's too much in this cabinet of curiosities, because the actual killer is what I've just put on. I've been so preoccupied with all this bullshit, I'd even pay attention to what I was changing into. It's a freaking school uniform. None of this makes any goddamn sense. Sam! The mother calls out, this time more impatiently, so I decide to humour this charade. But as I'm about to open the door, I'm stopped by a giant, keep out sign. At first, it almost feels like a warning. Then I realise that all of this stuff is slightly off place. If you think of a teen's room, this sort of sign will be the first thing to come to mind. But if you don't know where it should go, it's a 50-50 chance I'll end up on the wrong side. I carefully cast a last glance over the bedroom and realise there is no medical equipment. Unless I was in an induced coma, at least a drip would have made sense. How else did she feed me? Like a foie gras duck? I chuckle, shaking my head and open the doors with newfound confidence. I'm not sure where to go, but I follow the sound of the gentle hum made by the strange woman. The air is continuously stifling, and I pull on my collar. There seems to be something in it that I can't put my finger on, but it's there, almost choking me. As I walk through a small hallway, I notice odd porcelain figurines resembling Wizard of Oz characters littering the place. That's because they are just that. There's Dorothy and Toto, there's the Tin Man, even the Cowardly Lion and the Scarecrow. Hmm. Come to think of it, that Mother wears Alice's outfit too. It almost feels like a collage of my random thoughts. I smile, noticing a rotary dial phone standing on one of the shelves. Again, perfect example of what a phone is. When was the last time I saw one like it? This whole place is trying so hard to sow the breadcrumbs of my memory trail. It's an obvious construct made without any understanding. This knowledge emboldens me to face whatever comes next. Before I enter the kitchen, I'm stopped by a discreet yet discernible scent reaching my nose. It's barely tangible, but... I take a deep inhale. I'm sure it's there. Lavender. I blink my eyes, looking around in confusion. There's a scent of lavender in the air. As I scan the rooms adjacent to the hallway, I can see odd bouquets of those purple flowers dotting the place. I'm sure they weren't there before. Huh? I take a puzzled step into the kitchen, causing the other mother to finish her song. She turns on the heel with a big, wide smile, putting down a bowl she was just fiddling with. 
Oh, there you are. Don't you look smart? What's with all the lavender? I point towards another bouquet standing in the middle of the kitchen table. Oh, don't you just love it? She shrugs happily. They're my favourite. The smell is just divine. They weren't there just a moment ago. Oh, another one of your games. Oh, how fun. <clears throat> the woman laughs me off and returns to face the counter. I take a reluctant seat, looking at the flowers with double suspicion. Why didn't I smell this before? Oh, to be honest, I've got so used to them, I forget half the time they're even there. She shrugs, whipping something energetically inside the bowl. I feel so helplessly confused, I simply sit there, listening to a resumed humming. But the scent intensifies, as if it was calling out to me. I reach out to one of the stray stalks, and just as I touch the petals, the entire floret completely disintegrates into thin air, like it was never there. What the? Is everything all right, love? It's... It's hard to breathe, I mutter, getting slowly overwhelmed by the scent, as if someone doused the entire place with lavender perfume. My, I might have overdone it a little. She pats her cheek in a troubled expression and immediately proceeds to open the windows. Here, let me take these. The woman smiles and grabs the vase from the table. I don't know why, but I don't want her to take it away, so I reach out towards her arms. What's the matter, honey? Where are you taking them? Oh, just to another room. I'll be right back. As she disappears behind the door frame, the sweet floral aroma suddenly vanishes, replaced by a vague scent of fresh air. I look towards the open windows with suspicion, watching as the blinds bob on the wind. The smell might be gone, but the air is just as heavy as it was. When she returns, she pats my head and begins to hum again. For some reason, I get a really troubling vibe from her. I'd much rather be back with... With... Oh, fuck. What was the Grey Wolf's name? I close my eyes, rubbing my temple and straining to remember. How could I possibly forget it this fast? Oh, damn her obnoxious humming. Almost feels a bit scrambled in my thoughts and makes it harder to recall things. Mother, I mutter, drawing her attention and ending a siren's call for just a moment. I've decided I had enough of games. Something's not right. I know this isn't right. Oh, everything's fine, Sam. Soon you'll feel back at home. You'll see. Can't really feel at home with you having buttons for eyes. Oh, very funny, Coraline. She responds to my joke with a soft chuckle, but something about it feels off, almost as if my very own ghost children were telling me to run. Times like these, I'm glad I've consumed as much pop culture as I did. I need to go back. I state sternly, continuously preventing the woman from humming. You go back where? To... I struggle, desperate to speak up his name. To Rannoch! I exclaim with satisfaction through a strained huff. I want to go back to Tiernan. At first she looks at me in slight shock, then gives me a pitiful smile. Sweetie, I don't know what any of that means. I know you do, and I want you to let me go. Rannoch needs me. You're not a prisoner, dear. I'm not keeping you here. She splays her arms in feigned surrender. If Rannoch's one of your new friends, then by all means I don't object to you hanging out. Just as long as he's not a bad influence. Is he one of the foreign exchange students? The name sounds awfully funny. He's not an exchange student. He's a wolf. Oh. The woman clicks her lips and looks at me with pity. I can't remember the last time we went to the zoo, but if you want to... Not that kind of a wolf. He's a chief son and an alpha, and we're heading out to Strandbar tomorrow. I reiterate, not much for her sake to ensure I haven't forgotten anything in between her hellish humming. Hmm, fancy that. 
She shrugs and waves her hand at me. It was all just a dream, Sam. Soon you'll forget all about it. I don't want to forget about it. I jump up, slamming my hands into the table and yelling out in equal part frustration and desperation. But the woman only shakes her head dismissively. My complete surprise, she shoves a hastily made sandwich in my face. You're awfully moody today. Must be the hunger. Here, have a PPJ. What? I blink, grabbing the food in utter confusion. I thought we were having pizza. Well, I figured we could wait for Dad a little while longer. After all, he works so very hard to provide for us. Everything she says is so odd and surreal. Feels like I'm losing myself in his play pretend. I look to the generously loaded sandwich. Seeing as the mixture of jam and peanut butter nearly drips down to the floor, my stomach rumbles. I am quite hungry. Before I take a bite, a question occurs to me, and I blurt it out almost without even thinking. What does Dad do for a living? I'm sorry? The woman faces me, taken slightly aback. Work, Mom. As you know, my memory isn't so great. I poke my temple, still toying with the sandwich. I can see her eyes lock on my mouth, and she rubs her hands nervously, almost as if waiting for me to take a bite. Her ring is on the wrong finger, now that I think about it. Mom, what does Dad do? Why aren't you hungry? She asks to an awkward smile, and I shake my head, putting down the PBJ. Whatever is in it, I'll sooner starve than eat it. I'll wait. You worked so hard on my favourites. I don't want to ruin my appetite. You're right, of course. Her voice is now less chirpy. So, what does Dad do? Your father does business. He's very successful. It doesn't really look like it. I nod towards the middle-class-looking house. So, what's he do exactly? I just told you. Business. She smiles again and returns to face the counter, chopping at some carrots energetically. But carrots don't go on pizza, unless we're in California. I'll put anything on a pizza there, but this place doesn't fit the bill. It doesn't fit any bill now that I think about it. No, we're very, very much, we're still not in Kansas. We're not anywhere, really. The only chance of getting out is to break through the charade. Seeing that I have no other choice, I decide to push further and make this prison scape unravel. Yes, you said that, but what kind of business? Business is business, as they say. You don't know, then? A loud clang startles me. She slams a knife against the board and turns me with a less amused expression. Dearie, let's just give your little games a rest for now, hmm? She bobs the knife in my direction. I swallow nervously. After all, you have more important things to worry about. School starts tomorrow and you have much catching up to do. Whoever this other mother is, she's trying desperately hard to keep up a facade, but the jig is up. Okay, no, enough. What is this? I ask calmly, causing her to face me once again. She puts away the knife, corrects her dress and tidies up her hair, almost as if remembering her part. What happened, honey? Are you still feeling ill? The woman tries to reach out to me, but I jump out of the way as the f- if the floor were lava. Get away from me! Let me just check your temperature. I'm not fucking ill! I yell out in anger. Of course you are. I died. I know I did. Now I'm more certain of it than ever before. I am not dreaming, nor am I in a coma. I lived and I died, and now I live again. As crazy as it sounds, it makes more fucking sense than whatever this is meant to be. This is your home, she states matter-of-factly. This isn't real. You aren't real. It's the medication. You're just confused. I'm confused? I laugh out of the creature without a contempt. Think this shitty illusion is going to keep me in here? You're mistaken. You might have to fuck with my mind and fish out some snippets of memories. Your clunky attempts at reconstructing anything even remotely realistic are laughable. Her face grows now more stern, yet she maintains the act. 
Young mister, you do not speak to your mother like this. I've worked very hard. Stop, I demand calmly. You're not my mother, and this isn't home. Sam, you're breaking my heart. She clasped at her chest in a last-ditch attempt to emotionally blackmail me, for I'm immune to her tears. You have none. You aren't real. I call out, taking another step back. School? Really? What sort of lunatic would send their child to school a day after they woke up from a coma? Are you calling me a bad mother? Or is that it, your rebellious phase? The woman continues, but I'm having none of it. She's acting like a game character whose dialogue options are glitching. This is pathetic. I'm not a damn teen. You're just throwing a bunch of buzzwords with absolutely no context to them. Just like this place. Bunch of generic shit thrown in together. I spread my arms with scornful laughter. Looks exactly like what an alien would come up with after browsing the internet for reference. Whatever you are, you're not from my world. Whatever this is, it ends now. Oh. It ends, does it? Her voice turns unnaturally chilly. Finally, the game is over. Such a clever little boy. You think you don't like me? I freeze up, watching her form dark and elongate and twist, just like the bell ding. In fact, with her transformation, the entire house seems to warp onto itself. Her bony fingers gently pat the table, clicking as if they were made of glass, while she utters a frigid, otherworldly whisper. Its sound pierces my mind like a thousand needles, and I barely contain a scream. Well, wait until you see your father. Despite a cold shiver running down my spine, I try to remain calm. I won't be afraid. This thing is clearly feed on my memories and emotions. I won't see anything. I'm going back. There's no running away, Sam! She snickers, extending her bony fingers towards me to elicit some terror. I'm long beyond that. Just let mommy take care of you. We wouldn't want to be disciplined, would we? I had vulgar snarling muzzle inches from my throat. She's choking the life out of me. I was stabbed and nearly, cu- nearly killed by the chief. You think you're scary? You're reenacting a children's book. Oh, but I feel your heart dance to my tune, boy. You can't hurt me. Can't I? She smiles wickedly, accepting the challenge. Within a split second, the creature rushes at me, brushing the kitchen table out of the way as if it were nothing. I run as I've never run before, pushing myself from the walls to take a sharp left towards the bedroom. In the nick of time, I slam the door and turn the lock, just as he crashes into them with a considerable weight. I hear her bangs and wails as I slide to the floor. Fuck. Perhaps antagonising that thing wasn't the best idea. I need to get out of here, but how? For a second, I think about throwing myself out of the window. But if I die here, do I die in real life? No, there's got to be another way. Naively, I just close my eyes and click my heels together. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. I'll get you, my pretty, and you big wolf too! The monstrous screeches intensify and I begin to panic. Fuck. I need to get back. My heart spins out of control and I'm already hyperventilating. I'm in the grip of another panic attack. Oh my god, this is not the time for that. I yelp out as the door bounces with another bang. Sam, come out, honey. It's time for your medicine, but this time there'll be no spoonful of sugar to help it go down. She scratches against the door with her clawed fingers and I cringe at the sound. Come out, or I'll huff and puff. The creature's going to break in any moment. I try to calm myself down, but to no avail, only to remember how Rannoch managed to bring me down from a panic attack. Despite repeating the breathing exercises and squeezing my arms to mimic what he had done, it doesn't help. What I truly need is him. He was the one that calmed me. Wait. I need to follow my compass. 
Rannoch is my north. Rannoch is my anchor. With an anchor around her neck, the swimmers drown. Ignore her. I need to go back to him, back to the cabin. How do I get back? <laughs> the door bounces once again. This time the hinge is orderly given in. She issues an unnatural howl. I'm running out of time. Wait. Lavender. What? She stops momentarily her attempted breaking. With that one reaction, she gave away the key to my freedom. This is a dream, after all, not a place. I get up to my feet. I saw you manifest the flowers the moment I grew aware of their smell. It was the residual scent of the florets left in the cottage. That's why you removed it. No! She growls like a banshee, tracing a sharp fingernail against the door. But you didn't remove it. Not really. You made me think you did. No! She resumes her angered banging. Lavender. I need to focus on the scent of lavender. There it is. I can smell the sweet aroma once more, and the room begins to fade. No! Oh! The chirping of the birds reaches my ears, and her voice starts to fade away as well. No! Oh! The room grows darker, till I'm surrounded by utter nothingness once again. You will not get away from me! The bean issues a roar filled with utter hatred and anger, but is all quickly washed away by a feeling of unexplainable comfort. I smile as a slit of light pierces through the darkness. I can hear the familiar sound of the forest intensify. I already have. Wake up! My body almost sleeps at the chance to break free from slumber. You cannot keep him hidden in the waking world forever! At first I feel unsettled by that comment, but quickly the feeling of comfort returns. Wake up! The cold air rushes in my windpipe and I take a desperate inhale. I throw myself up, sitting in the bed completely startled, touching my entire body and patting the bed in beside me. Once I'm convinced enough that I'm back in the real world, I manage to calm down my erratic breathing. The bedding is soggy. I sweated a lot during my sleep. No wonder. I spent the entire night locked in a mind game while physically enveloped by a furry wolf. Speaking of said wolf, Rannoch's nowhere to be seen, and I immediately fear he's left without me. I look towards the open window, which allows the fresh air to come in and mingle with the lingering scent of lavender florets. I never thought I'd be so happy to smell lavender. Here we are. Judging by the light, I don't think Rannoch has left yet. It's bright. Not bright enough for it to be too close to noon, but way past sunrise, that's for sure. I shudder suddenly, startled by a creaking sound coming from up above. It's followed by some clunking, and it becomes clear as someone's up there. Rannoch? I call out to the kitchen, hoping the wolf is about. To my surprise, his voice comes from the ceiling. Oh, Sam, you're up. Yeah. I might have slightly choked up. I'm relieved to hear him. What are you doing? We're getting stuff ready for our departure. We need gear for the trip. You should have woke me up. My voice might carry slightly more annoyance than it should as I scramble to get out of the bed. We all slept like a rock. I didn't want to disturb you. Well, you still should have. In truth, I wish he had. But then again, he might not have been able to pull me out of the stupor, and then he'd be all panicked. Perhaps it's best this way. Do you need any help? I ask, quickly locating various pieces of my garment dotting the floor, a memento of our rather passionate evening. I blush, reminiscing how close we've gotten to... Um, well, not really. I wouldn't mind some company. The wolf pulls me back into reality, and I shake my head. Not the time to be getting horny again. I'll be right there. I begin to put my clothes on hastily, and once I'm presentable, I step into the kitchen, only to stop at the entry and face the ceiling once again. How do I get up? Well, there's a ladder at the back of the cabin. Oh, okay. 
I step outside and take a free, deep inhale of the forest air, enjoying the view for what it's worth. The beauty of the spot on which he built his house is more apparent than ever before. Especially now that I got out of the hellscape I was trapped in. I don't even consider talking about what happened tonight. Why do you even say they wouldn't be immediately brushed off as just a bad dream? Or worse yet, if you actually believe me, he'd send me straight to Verissa for observation. Now we go our joint excursion. No, talking about this is not an option. Not now, at least. After all this pep talk about being self-reliant, it would be dumb for me to unload this stuff on the unsuspecting wolf. Hey, so, well, since we're dating, I need to know I'm possessed. Hope it's not a deal-breaker. I shake my head and snort at the mock-up confession. No. I'd much rather focus on being together and enjoying the time we have. Especially since so far I'm having the upper hand and keep this stuff under control. Push comes a shove, I'll simply copy Verissa's markings. But for now, I'm here, free, taken in the glorious woods around me. I don't think it was ever this outdoors in my previous life, whatever it was. This new experience grew on me unexpectedly quickly. Even you, Mr. Outhouse, you ain't that bad. I mumble towards the bushes behind which rests the rustic toilet. Probably the least pleasant part of this old-timey way of life, but still much better than whatever the fuck I was presented with tonight. As promised, I'm greeted by a wobbly ladder scaling the back wall of the cottage and leading up towards a small door. I climb the pegs and squeeze myself in, wondering how on earth did Rannoch manage to get through. At first, my eyes take some time to adjust to the dimly lit attic, but soon enough I can see that it's a small space filled with lots of different stuff. Rannoch's rested against the front wall, sitting beneath the only window and filling with a large piece of tawny brown cloth. What's up? Oh, my moon rob is up. He teases as I slowly crawl my way up towards him. Well, I was making sure there aren't any tears. The last thing we need is getting wet on our journey. Yeah, I know my poor fluff doesn't like water. Yeah, it's actually more for your comfort than mine. I finally get to snuggle into his chest and ruffle the grey fur. Hey, what's this? It was rather surprised at my forwardness, but I don't care. After all that happens throughout the night, I just need to be held by him and feel his warmth. Smell his scent. Soon enough, my silent wish is granted. And he braces me tightly, lifting my chin so our gazes could meet. His kind green eyes look to me with love as he plants a quick lick across my lips. I slept well? Heh. <laughs> I nearly choke at the absurdity of the question given the circumstance, but he decided to simply shrug it off. So-so. I don't want to ruin the moment, nor to trouble him with whatever I'm going through. I'm getting more convinced this is not madness, but yeah, not the time for a little moment. I simply pull away gently and look around the various gizmos littering the ground. Anything I can help with? Well, not really. I don't think you'd know where to start. Fair enough. I chuckle. So I'll just settle myself in this corner and get out of your way. A oh, good boy. Hey, that compliment goes the other way around. I narrow my eyes teasingly, causing his tail to thumb against the wooden floor. The attic is surprisingly busy for a wolf whose house looks rather spartan. So, we're heading out just the two of us. He smiles at me knowingly and narrows his brows. Indeed, we'll get some quality time together. What about your pack? I have a different task. With Tano leaving to find Dalran, my father called all able-bodied wolves to deliver howl summons. Wool left just before dawn. Oh. I respond rather mopey. I think I'd wish him safe travels. Oh, trust me, he's in no mood for talking. He nearly clocked me when I joked he's rushing off so early to avoid bumping into Regara. Yeah, that one seems a rather sore spot for him. Well, serves him right. Rannoch shrugs, ruffling the tent cloth to inspect another of the folds. He gets a taste of his own medicine. I'd even go as far as say Regar is much more tactful than he ever was with Marissa. I smile awkwardly. It doesn't take much to imagine how badly the Black Wolf butchers his attempts at wooing the female. I bet he's improving with time. He does with me. I flash my brows, drawing Rannoch's curious gaze. 
I mean, at first his instinct was to kill me on sight, the point he had to shield me. Now he only talks about killing me when he's annoyed. Wolves always annoyed. The wolf sneers in jest and I chuckle. I suppose, but not always with me. I say with some sense of confidence, and the wolf simply nods in concession. For all my director's outbursts at me, I get a feeling it's more out of habit than genuine dislike. With a short lull in the conversation, I look around the attic once again. There's a bunch of odds and ends up here. With idle hands, I decide to check the nearest box, only to find an assortment of different chisels and tools. A true carpenter, I see. Well, not a professional. He shrugs modestly. Just something to pass the time with. Each wolf has a hobby. Maybe, but I don't many made their own furniture. You'd be surprised. The wolf smiles, reaching up the corners of the tent and slowly beginning to fold it up. There's not much need for stuff like that within the tribe, for him to make it their full-time profession, so we must all make do on our own. We don't even have a jeweller. The village smith has to double as one. You mean Regara's father? Yeah. He sighs. Truth be told, she's slowly been taking over his work. The wolf is getting too old for that profession. I quickly touch the emblem on my collar, petting it slightly. I don't find anything wrong with your crest. It's lovely. You... you enjoy it? I smile reluctantly, looking towards the exit as if I wanted to run away. I do, actually. It's embarrassing as it is to admit. It makes me feel like I belong. You're not my prop... I know. I cut him off, facing him with a confident smile. I meant to be longing at your side. Oh. He blushes slightly and looks away. Despite getting quite flustered, I can see his tail wagging happily behind his back. Maybe he can sense my heart rate, but I can read his moods just as well. So, what's up with that busted chair? I nod towards the broken upturned seat and Rannock looks at it awkwardly. Oh, that... I meant to fix it, but quickly realised it wasn't sturdy enough. Might as well use it as firewood now. Those are claw marks. A grim is pointing the obvious signs of violence. Yeah, a token of one of Vol's many tantrums. He hurled at me one very to stay the night. He thought that we... The wolf pauses, twiddling bashfully with his fingers, but quickly shaking his head. Well, we didn't. Jeez, he's quite possessive of her. Yeah. He sighs in feigned amusement. Why was she staying the night, though? She doesn't strike me as a sleepover type of gal. Well, oh, she needed comforting, and Cora was away with Dalron's pack. The shaman just passed away, and she's reeling from both his loss and a new appointment. Damn, that was a perfect time for Vol to shine. It was then. Are you kidding? Rannoch snorts. The reason she came to me in the first place, despite all the rumours it would cause, is because the first thing he did was to ask her to be his mate. He cornered her out in the open, smile ear to ear for everyone to see, ignoring completely the tribe's mourning. I cringe, imagine the scene cause and how distressed Verissa had to be. That guy really doesn't have a clue, does he? The worst part, he barged into you while you were breaking fast, most likely spurred by the talk on the street. Without waiting for an explanation, he simply hurled that chair half across the room, nearly taking us, out, us both out with it. What? I gasp, half in shock and half in amusement that I'm even surprised. After all, I've experienced that side of him myself, but it's not something I'm going to share. Full has enough bad reps it is to deal with. Yeah, so when I tell you it's out of his way at the moment, it's because I mean it. Anyway, I better hurry up with all this for Father sends the guards to fetch us. I laugh and nod, allowing him to get back to the task at hand without further distractions. Eventually, he finally gathers everything up and stuffs it neatly into a leather backpack. But the wolf doesn't stop there. He fetches the ropes, mine pins and other odds and ends, filling the pockets to the brim, beginning to worry about the size our luggage begins to grow to. As we leave the attic, I decide to voice my concerns. This is a lot of stuff. Are you sure we need all of this? My voice conveys doubts I take hold of the burgeoning backpack he passes to me from above. I struggle to place it down on the ground, causing the dangling metal pan and pot to clang merrily together. 
Well, that's just a bed in the tent cloth. What about this, then? I point to the hanging cooking utensils, and the wolf shrugs. We need those. It's going to be a long trek, or you must eat well. I'm not sure I'll be able to carry all of this. You'll have to. The wolf states plainly through a coy smile. He closes the attic door and slides down the ladder, landing on the ground with a dusty oof. Because what I'll be carrying, you definitely won't be able to lift. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mutter, intrigued by his comment. Come, let's get some quick rub. Get ready and head for the villa. I nod reluctantly, trying to pick up the overloaded bag. I slump it over my shoulder and simply carry it, trying to catch up to the wolf. Once we're inside, Ranak starts up the fire and cooks us up a solid breakfast, just like he did on my first day here. We need our strength the road, so eat up. None of that I'm full nonsense. He teases, mimicking my manner of speech as he places down the loaded plates. Despite eating quite well the previous night, for some reason I feel quite hungry and I dig in with little to no objections. We enjoy our breakfast together, with me trying to prod him for additional information every now and then. But he dismisses all attempts with simple, you'll see. It's as clear he's as eager and excited to show me around as much as I'm eager to finally see the world outside of this village. Not that it didn't grow on me. Here, in this cottage, listening to the gentle wind and crackling of fire, there's something the delectable smell of bacon and eggs. I feel truly at home. Halfway through our meal, a knock comes to the door and Ranak rushes to open them. Oh, that must be Verissa. He mutters, wiping his muzzle clean of egg yolk and pulling on the door handle. I don't have long. She states plainly, walking in and placing her bag onto the table with a soft thud. Got the stuff you asked for. A file of onion and ginger root in case he gets a fever. I watch as she deposits the aforementioned items onto the wooden top with a risen brow. Me? Either of you? She corrects herself awkwardly. But considering your lack of fur, my money's on you getting ill. I also have elderflower and coriander for pain relief and inflammation, as well as lichen salve for any open wounds. That's a lot of stuff you brought us. I flash my brows, returning to my meal. Better safe than sorry, I say. I guess. I appreciate the protectiveness, so I won't argue. This feels slightly over the top. If you end up using the ginger root, I expect you to buy it back at the market once you get to Strandbard. This stuff isn't exactly common, nor cheap. Oh, of course. You both reek of lavender. Quite potently, might I add. She says with an odd suspicion in her voice, now in her eyes as if demanding an explanation. Someone came into my house and peppered it with dried florets, stinking up the whole place. I didn't have time to clear them out, so we ended up smelling like perfume ponces. Ranuk beats me to it, causing Verissa to raise her brow even higher. Funny you should say that. Uh, someone raided my cottage as well. Her voice is sombre and she looks around in deep concern. They stole a bunch of stuff. My entire lavender supply with it. Why would someone steal your lavender only to dump it in our place? A good question. The female nods, gazing at Ranok expectantly. Did they take anything? Not that I could tell. And I assume you couldn't identify them by scent either. Not over this damn smell. My wolf nearly growls, and she nods in fearful agreement. That's what I thought. Lavender has a potent fragrance, good for masking scent. At least you slept well. Wait, what do you mean? That last part caught me off guard. Lavender is a medicinal herb. It calms and relaxes. That's why I added it to your soap. You're a bundle of nerves. If you spend a night surrounded by its scent, it will send you into a deep, undisturbed sleep. I often use it myself to enter a meditative state. You don't say. I mutter, increasingly convinced that yesterday's breaking wasn't as innocent as I initially thought. Was Andalt really responsible for my nightly trip? The idea did cross my mind, but... That would mean he's in league with the Whispers. Or worse yet, he's the Whispers himself. Then again, Lavender was the key of my escape from that nightmare realm. So was it just all a coincidence? Or was he just this incompetent? 
I wrestle with those questions, only to be brought back to here and now by Verissa's gentle paw landing on my shoulder. Is everything all right? I think so. Just a bit spooked the two people had their houses broken into. Ranok tells me it's not a common occurrence around here. Oh, not at all. Defiling someone's den is a grievous transgression. Wolves were banished for this. Well, I think it's Tano trying to fuck with me. No. Rosa shakes her head softly and I almost audibly agree with her. Say what you will, but Tano respects your boundaries, and he would never ignore the sanctity of a shaman's household. This year is the work of an unhinged wolf with a death wish on his head. You mean to say it's Andalt? She closes her eyes and nods solemnly. Why would he start shit with me? He knows I have no patience for games. My big Sam stays with you. I honestly don't know what's going on with him. Do you think you and Tano are bad blood? I never spoke to that wolf after his outburst at my anointment. I saw him once observing me from a distance. I decided to pitch in. No need to live in uncertainty when we can all collaborate our stories. I also know he's snooping around the cottage a few nights back when you were away. How do you know? I just do. I shrug. With what Verissa said, I grow more and more confident Tano has been honest with me, at least to a point. I'm not about to break his confidence. That bastard! Rannock growls nastily, squeezing his fists in anger. What game is he playing at? I wouldn't know, but I also wouldn't join it either. The female places a comforting pause on both of our chests. And else is a few peas short of a stew. We have more important things to deal with than his misguided antics. Well, have you broke into our homes? He continues to sneer if the female cuts him off. So what of it? He stole some herbs and made your house smell nice. She rolls her eyes, splaying her arms in clear annoyance. Look, I have wounded to tend to. I must prepare for the howl on top of that. And to lead the ceremonies, which, considering my lack of training, is a lot of responsibility to someone my age. Her voice carries an obvious strain, and Rannoch looks at her worriedly, causing the female to sigh and give him a soft, encouraging smile in turn. I'm sorry, please. I didn't mean it like that. I can manage. But we all have our own responsibilities to attend to. You need to get to Strandbad and secure supplies. I... She falls silent, grasping her elbow with one paw and reluctantly looking to the side. I'm working with weeds here. I had to patch them up on mushrooms and moonshine. We need real medicine. The female stresses, facing my wolf with determination. We need salves and potions from Thygeria apothecaries. The old man left our stocks dangerously low on anything remotely useful. I was this close to amputating Inea's arm. Thankfully it didn't come to that as she's a stubborn little bitch. Rissa smiles teasingly, almost if trying to encourage herself as much as us. And she cracked her fang while biting on the leather strap that has set in her bones back in place. I can't work under these conditions. If there is a war coming, I'll be as useful to the tribe in healing capacity as Volgor is. In fact, I was considered sending for him yesterday. She cringes, obviously not the idea of him aiding her, but what he would aid her in. The image of him chopping someone's arm off causes me to shudder. I meant to be a healer, and reduce the role of a butcher, or worse yet, a torturer. That's why I don't think a grief-stricken wolf skulking in the woods is our primary concern. You're all right, as usual. Rannock responds almost begrudgingly, and I smile. Well, it doesn't sit right with me. If I'm not, it becomes unpredictable. It's a problem for another day. I still hope he'll come around. We all do. I can't imagine what Tybalt must be going through. The wolf sighs and takes a deep chug of beer. As the saying goes, sow your seed far and wide lest you end up empty-handed. That is, if you intend to have pups. She darts her gaze towards me, but I don't think Rannoch noticed. He only laughs, rubbing the back of his neck awkwardly. Uh, of course I do, but that is also a problem for another day. Smooth save, I think. Anyway, as I said, I can't stay long. I wish you safe journey. The female comes closer and places her paws on our chests once again. The moon goddess watches over you, both of you. 
She says that more in a form of a blessing, which I assume it is. She walks towards the doors. She comes to a stop and looks back towards us with a rather troubled gaze. I know it must be hard for you, but you'll find a way. She says reluctantly, and looked at Rana, whose entire expression shifted. He's serious and solemn. I know how to get there. I've travelled that path once before. Indeed. The female narrows her brows and gives a nervous tail flick before stepping out. You'll be fine, Sam. What was that about? Asked rather taken by that ominous exchange. Well, she's always doubted my ability. Treat me as if I were a pup. His voice sounds very sour. I always want to pat him in sympathy. I doubt that's true. She just worries. Well, encouragement would be better than nagging. What she said was technically an encouragement. Then why didn't I feel like it? Relax, Mr Grumpy Pants. It's your hunger talking. I smile softly, nodding towards our unfinished breakfast. Not entirely sure what else to tell him, for I make up my mind he's back digging at his meal. I decide not to interrupt him. His mood is rather testy, and we should be leaving shortly anyway. I'm slightly troubled by Verissa's behaviour near the end, though. There was something off about the way she looked at me, almost as if she was sad. Or perhaps I'm just reading into things. After all, she's been through hell of her very own. We spend the rest of the time in a relative silence. Once we finish with the food, we empty our mugs and I help clean up. Can't leave dirty dishes for a whole week, which I'm told is as long as this trip is going to take. I ensure nothing is going to get mouldy or attract insects. Ranak packs the remainder of our stuff and dons his gear. When that's done, I pick up one of Ranok's spare cloaks and put it on, securing my new dandelion in its pin. It does clash a bit with the dress, but it'll protect my skin from bruising against the leather straps of the backpack. Now I look like a fancy hobbit. I require the wolf's help from the backpack, grunting audibly when he lets it rest freely on my shoulders. You'll get used to it. Not a comforting thought, if I'm to be honest. Well, it's time we get some muscle on those boats. He winks coyly and opens the door. He invites me to go outside with a gracious paw wave and I take one last look across the cottage. I'll miss this place, that's for sure. My mood is lifted by a simple thought there'll be a journey there and back again. It's a dangerous business, my dear Frodo, going out the door. I muse playfully, walking through the door for him and causing Rannock to blink. Frodo? You step onto the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there's no telling where you might be swept off to. I didn't realize you had a poetic bent. He chuckles while closing the door behind him, and I shrug with a soft smile. Plenty of time to learn more about each other on the open road. Well, very true. The wolf nods when we set off towards the villa, where we were to pick up our instructions and last piece of luggage. We barely left the village, I can already feel the straps dig into my flesh. The backpack sits heavily, pushing me much harder into the road. Mm. My feet are killing me, but the dress is my main concern. With the way the straps brush tight against my skin, I worry it might tear. Do you really think it's a good idea for me to travel like this? I put out the room of my dress with a rather troubled expression. It might be comfortable, but I'm not sure if it's durable enough. Are you kidding? The wolf snorts. Well, it's silk. I don't think there's a more durable cloth out there. Besides, it's not like we have any other options. I'm about to enter a Tigari town with a ragged human in tow. Yeah, that would not be a good look for us, would it? Speaking of being ragged, I could get some shoes for the journey. I stop for a moment and wiggle my left foot in jest. How do you imagine walking a few days straight barefoot? What shoes? Yet again, the wolf throws me off with, in hindsight, an obvious question. Um, oh. How do you know what shoes even are? Well, it's the sort of clothing you put on your feet. Whatever for? To protect them from injury. There's lots of sticks and pebbles on the ground. I yelp uncomfortably as I step onto one such unlucky stone, causing the wolf to snort. Oh, Vol's right. You really are a flower. Wolves have been walking bare paw without injuring their pads since the awakening. You just need to step carefully and softly. 
He tries to lighten his tone so his comment doesn't come across as chastising, but it's hard not to take it as such. Besides, with your paws covered, how do you feel the vibration of the ground? It's quite important for alertness. I wouldn't, because I don't. I'm not a wolf. I mumble in slight offence. Again, despite him being humanoid, our point of reference couldn't be more alien to one another. I don't think I'm being unreasonable. Perhaps I could get some thick cloth to wrap my feet in. This time it's he who stops, giving me a rather startled look. I'm telling you, it's better than me cutting my feet on something and having you carry me the rest of the way. The little threat seems to have done the trick, so he simply nods in reluctant concession. Humans are curious creatures, aren't they? He shakes his head, but his voice carries both amusement and a twinge of awe, empowered by his loveful gaze and a gentle tail swish. Well, you would know best. I try to contain a blush and get us on the move again. It doesn't take long to arrive at the fork where the side path leads to the villa. We pass between the columns and soon enough we're greeted by the meticulously maintained garden. To no surprise I can see bramble and leaf scurry about, with the female bunny giving me suspicious gaze as she cuts into the hedge with the scissors. I notice the particularly unruly branch she's measuring. When she's set to cut it, she diverts her eyes to me. Chomp and the imperfection is gone. Her intensive gaze and satisfaction on the muzzle leave no doubt she's imagined my head to be said twig. I cringe, moving ever so slightly closer to my wolf. He pays the bunnies no mind and leads us through the porticus, deep into the shade of the atrium. Again, I can't help but gawk open mouth the magnificence of this room. I have to say, I love this spot so much. I utter quietly, drawing his approving smile. It's so peaceful. The light dances beautifully on the water's surface. Yeah, I like it too. I used to play here with wooden boats as a pup. Imagine the pool to be Lake Tremelin. His soft gaze ventures to the water. He stirs its surface with his paw, causing the nearby water lilies to bounce merrily. Also used to come to think and rest here. It's a good room, but often quite busy. He turns back towards the gardens. There's been the entrance and all. I still can't believe you. I feign some offence, giving him a challenging look. Criticising me for being uppity while you lived in a freaking palace. Lived being your operative tense. He winks and bops his head inquisitively towards the main hall. I nod and we proceeded to enter. Well, finally, he's about to send someone to fetch you. The chief grumbles in annoyance we enter the great hall. He's seated with Vither at the top table, looking over a stack of papers. I take an informed guess that those are the letters they were talking about last night. Howl summons. Oh, I'm sorry. I find all the travel gear and sure it's in working order. Rannock responds, patting the backpack I'm carrying and drawing an audible oof from me, so I'm reminded of the load. When we come to a stop in front of the table, I take liberty in dropping the bag onto the ground. Both wolves look at it with slight bewilderment. Uh, seems a bit much, doesn't it? Why are you taking the tent? I echo my very own concerns from just a few moments ago. Look to the wolf with a subtle, what did I say, face. Well, the human is furless and there are still cold nights ahead. Last thing I want is for him to catch something before we even get there. He responds awkwardly, causing the two older wolves to exchange confused gazes. Hmm... Thankfully, the side door cracking open draws their attention, and I see Trist walk in with a silver picture. We exchange cordial gazes, and I wink to him as he passes by. Well, thank you, but you can take it away. We have a long day ahead of us, and we need to maintain clear heads. The old wolf dismisses the bunny, causing Vither to shudder. Oh, I'm not even a little drinky? I'm parched, and I have a massive headache. He pleads, causing the bunny to stop and observe their ensuing exchange for further instruction. It's a sober job, Vither. Tell that to Anel. That crazy old minx nearly drank me under the table. You shouldn't have been drinking last night. The chief sounds unamused and the brown male protests. Oh, she doesn't listen. She asked for a drink and once she's done with it she forgot she already had one. I hope she's fine. She's not 80 anymore. You can't treat her like a drinking buddy. Get us to an exasperated sigh, rubbing the ridge above his eyes. 
Honestly, you should have seen her in the morning. She got up like nothing happened and went home. I'm not alone, I hope. Of course not. Who do you think I am? With a scoff's in evident offence. I asked Cora to escort her. Oh, good. You need to be careful with her, is all I'm saying. We can't afford to lose a nail before the howl. Honestly, Varrock, take more than the bottle of moonshine to kill her. And I'm not about to chastise a near-century old female, telling her what she can and cannot do. Either way, there'll be no drinking. The chief again squishes his hand at Trist, and the bunny turns on his heel in quite a surprise. I guess stuff is really serious if they forgo the booze. It was amusing listening to Anel's antics. So, she's nearly a hundred years old. That is quite impressive. I really can't help but wonder what she was like in her youth. It must seem to her like a lifetime away. Father, I was wondering if perhaps Tris could aid Sam in procuring one last thing we need for our journey. Rannock steps forward, drawing the expectant gazes, and the chief snaps his fingers, causing the bunny to freeze. Oh, and what would that be? We need something to cover his feet with. Those enderpoles are naturally soft and prone to injury. Well, I don't think I follow. The old male narrows his eyes, clearly getting impatient with what he perceives as a silly request. Well, trust me, make our journey go much smoother. Oh, very well. The chief sighs and waves his paw both at me and the bunny, allowing us to disappear into the side room. What was that about? Trist asks with a rather confused expression. Can you arrange some robust cloth for me, or a thick piece of leather would do? Whatever for? I need to make some bandages to wrap around my feet. Did you catch yourself? No, but I need to protect my souls on the journey. Humans usually don't walk around barefoot. I say, but there's now silly must sound to his widening smirk. That's a bit fruity. He stifles a chuckle, looking at me with pity. The road will be long and most likely covering difficult terrain. My skin bruises easily. Hmm, I'll see what I can find. Would linen be enough? The bunny proposes, and I nod eagerly. It would. Bring anything you've got. I'll wait here, then. He pats my shoulder and leaves her when the side doors leading deeper into the complex. I hang around the door, listening on to the conversation, but I'm not getting much out of it. The chief and Vithas simply list of supplies around a cast to secure. Aside from some grains, they also need steel, and quite a lot of it. I'm also relieved to hear them speak of medical supplies, which apparently lack troubled me deeply after the conversation with Varissa. Before I can full eye into my snoopy mode, the brown bunny returns with my query. I hear you go. He lays down an assortment of items on the side table. I found some burlap sacks. They're roughly the size of your feet. The bunny hoists them up in the air and closes one eye to measure them against me. I also have some bandages and the leather you asked for. Thanks, Trist. I owe you one. A tool, actually. He winks, clearly hinted at my scavenger hunt from yesterday. I simply nod in agreement. Burr's often tried to go about this. Eventually I decide to trace the outline of my foot on the leather piece. The bunny observes that I cut out the shape with a knife, careful not to cut myself whenever the blade slips against the stubborn pelt. Once I have two flappy soles, I scooch myself onto the counter and try to affix them to the underside of my feet with tight bandaging. In this I needed some help, and Trist aids me as best he can. It takes a short while, but eventually everything is neatly in place and I jump off from the table feels amazing not to have to endure the cold stone underfoot. My beaming expression draws an amused scoff from the bunny. I must admit, this looks rather peculiar. Trist mutters, watching as I put on one of the burlap sacks. It's quite shallow, and the tie handle secures it tightly around my ankle, almost looking like an old-timey shoe. Well, it's not the comfiest type of footwear, but it does the job. Then I can find a cobbler in Strandbad and be able to get myself a proper pair. At the very least, they must have sandals. I think out loud, causing the bunny to laugh. He said the darndest of things. You always sound like my nana. Her mind was never quite there, but near the end, she was blabbering nonsense just like you. 
I'll miss you, snarky ass. I smirk at him coyly. I won't miss yours. He teases right back. Your sass with the elders almost beggars belief. Maybe once you're back, I'll finally get to enjoy your execution. Maybe. I wink, restraining myself from returning the joke. Any sort of playful threat of harm will be inappropriate right now towards the bunny. He notices my slight apprehension and waves his paw at me. I don't. He mutters sternly. I don't need your pity, just keep in mind what we talked about. I nod. I won't. Not after what I heard yesterday. Tris gives me a half smile and sighs. Just don't die out there, you little freak. And you pray you of a front row seat to watch me draw my final breath? Never. I laugh as he bobs my shoulder encouragingly and decide to return to the main hall. I've been absent long enough. It's amazing how used I got to the soft slap in my feet across the wooden stone. That sound is now replaced with a subtle ruffling of burlap with each of my steps. I walk up to the centre of the room, drawing immediate attention from the chief and vithor who look at me with risen brows. Now that's the most unusual thing I've seen the entire year. That includes Volgan early getting neutered by Varissa. He's got to be a laughing stock. The chief doesn't mirror his friend's levity. It gives me a rather aggravated look. Well, I bet where he comes from, it's quite normal. Otherwise, he wouldn't need it. Rannock tries to reason on my behalf and Vither shrugs. Hang on, see, I think we've wasted enough time on that twerp. The chief nods in agreement. Do you have my letter of recommendation? Hey, here it is, sealed and ready. He passes a sizable envelope to the chief and the old male nods in satisfaction. Oh, good. Hold it right there. We all jolt up to attention at the now startly familiar screeching. Oh, for the love of a Luna! Cute, Varrock, real cute! The pudgy female wheezes on her way up towards the table. Do you really think I would miss this? Why wasn't I consulting Rannock's apparent diplomatic mission? I'm seriously considering bringing back the day guards at the door. People are coming out of, the, out of this place as if it were in. The chief mutters to Vitha, paying the old hag no mind. Oh, hell! But she'd not be ignored, and Vitha leans to his side, resting against the armrest. Ah, oh, I thought you stormed off before the meeting ended. I'll have to wait for the very last moment to bring the matter up. Really, send in your centre back and grovel for scraps on your master's table. She takes on a more contemptuous tone than usual and the brown male scoffs. I only call it begging if we're paying for it. Say what you will, but we need supplies. I nod internally, watching as Rannock visibly tenses up. He really hates that fat bitch, and with good reason. Uh, safe than sorry, that's something even you can't argue against. And this perfect waste of tribe's gold has been safe? Ha! Huh? First, we need to get the trade rights. The chief shrugs, sorting through the papers in front of him. As it stands, our wolves are not allowed to use Strandbad's market for anything other than personal use. That's where the grovelling will come in handy. Man, you must really despise your son to submit him such humiliation. I shudder, hearing a clear growl escape Rannock's throat, and the female gives him a cautious look, followed by a few steps away. My son will do what must be done for our people. I think it's past time he took one on a more official role. That is to say, if you hope to retain your seat. She continues her taunting, her gaze now ventures to me and I roll my eyes. Why is this naked monkey here? Are you seriously thinking I would let you send him off just like that? Well, send him off? The chief blinks in confusion, looks to Vitha, who only shrugs. Oh, cut the I know what you're up to. Can you read the evidence just before how is exactly the sort of underpolis I expect of you? He is Rannoch's attendant. The old male reiterates calmly. He's just carrying his load. And what is to prevent your son from misplacing a little whelp somewhere in that cursed Targary town? As a whim, I suppose. Rither shrugs indifferently. 
Braddock seems awfully keen on the bugger. Oh, spare me. You know how pressed the issue at the Hound have that humans disappear to make any attack on your cell moot. You two have planned this. Her voice bellows across the marbled hall. She thumps her fat foot against the floor. You think your son will take your place, and you want to see your scheming little harlot sit beside him? Not the first time a scheming little harlot would align herself with this chair, is it? With the quip says through a snarl, and the comment feels somewhat personal as Aldrich just looks at him dumbfounded. I don't think there's anything we could say to convince you otherwise, so I don't see a point to this conversation. The chief spreads his arms in defeat. Britha gazes at her challengingly. Let's assume the worst. Oh, what? What are you talking about? She narrows her brows, the fat of her face squinting her eyes so much she might as well have closed them. Let's assume Rallock will misplace, as you so nicely put it, the human in Strandbath. What of it? You have witnesses confirm he was here. No one is going to deny his actual existence. His whereabouts have no relevance to his case, are they? The brown male states, and Val, I mean Aldris, clearly struggles with the proposition. Damn it, and they'll even make me do it. I, uh, well, he must. She stumped. Her argument proved flawed. There would have to be a cross-examination. A cross-examination? The chief scoffs in amusement. Who's the daft mute? Can't even speak the damn word. Might as well question trees. Uh, what about his death, then? She spats angry, looking at me with determination. His debt has to be paid off. Very well, what is it worth? What? The pudgy female blinks in confusion, taken aback by the question. The door exit has been here, what is it worth to you? What sort of trickery is this? We're playing ball. Ritha shrugs yet again. It's clear they're done with her. I really have more important things to do right now and quibble with you over some petty nonsense. Everyone lost their moon damn mind the moment they say waltz into our village. That includes you. I... I smile, seeing her loss of words. It's clear it's not a sensation she's familiar with. She quickly switches to anger and waves her finger at them as they were naughty children. Now listen here. We are listening. You're just not giving us an answer. What is it worth to you? The brown male reiterates. She darts her gaze back to the chief who leans in with a smile. You are now. They have virtual right to dictate that rate as we do. Give us your estimate. Silence takes over the room. She carefully thinks this over. Every now and then she looks to me into Rannoch, who clearly has a troubled expression. and This gives her an idea. Ten silver a day. Oh, hold on a moment. Ritha raises his paw in protest. The chief nods with satisfaction. Uh, then. What? You can't be serious. That's extortionate. His surprise equals that of the fat bitch, although I am a bit lost in this conversation. What does it matter when Rannoch will return with the boy in tow? that will be even twenty silver a day. You're absolutely right. Make it twenty, then. She smiles nastily, certain she's called the chief's bluff. The male nods in agreement, completely throwing her off. Well, so be it. That brings the total to three talents, am I right? The old male looks at her expectantly. She nods reluctantly. Perfect. He pats the table. Should the human vanish in a puff of smoke, that's exactly what I expect my son to repay. Seems a fair price for a mistake of bringing him in the first place, wouldn't you agree? I might not all game you to a plane, but know this, no one to trick you is going to save your face at the howl. The pudgy female sneers, only drawing an indifferent shrug from him. Maybe, but I really don't have time for this. Thank you for the honour of your visit, but now be so kind. And get the hell out of my home! The chief nods towards the doors, but she protests. I want to be present at the handling of the treasury. That is none of your concern. The chief can dispense with it at his leisure. I want to know how much. You'll be able to find that out at a later point. Ritha cuts her off. I seem you're able to deduce how much is missing. His tones don't sit well with her and she begins to simmer. Before she can explode, the chief stands up and speaks with a slightly risen tone. 
You have tested the limits of my patience. I'm afraid we're at a breaking point. I won't repeat myself. Leave my home or I'll have better summon guards and drag you to the courtyard like a trespasser you are. I can see her clenching her fist in anger as she struggles to stifle the growl. Eventually she turns around and storms off as a brisk pace as when she came in. When she's gone, the chief sighs and sits down, looking towards the brown male. I wasn't joking about the guards, by the way. Oh, I know. Ritha nods. I want two wolves standing at the entry night and day, controlling the ingress and egress of people. No matter who comes there, report to Trist and Trist is to check back with me. Unless it's either of those two. He growls softly under his breath. As far as they're concerned, I might be dead. I don't want them here uninvited. Understandable. Anyway, where were we? Oh yes, uh, the letter. The chief pops in turn towards Ranok, who approaches and takes hold of it. I'm not sure how much my name is worth in Strandbard nowadays, but oh, that should, it should indeed arise, it'll be of some use to you. Well, I'd rather diminish it, father. What could be worse than obscurity? The old male chuckles, pushing a large wooden box towards my wolf. Here, take a good look. Guard it with your life. He says it rather sternly, and observes Ranok carefully lifts up, lifts up the lid. Almost like in a movie, the hall floods with a golden shimmer empowered by the sunlight creeping in from various windows. Holy shit! I find myself exclaiming at Ranok, spurred by the sight of more gold than I could have ever imagined. It's all arranged into slender, glimmering bars adorned with the familiar Celtic knot motif, packed tight inside the chest. I'm sure I would have been utterly terrified at a slip of the tongue, had I not still reeled from the glimpse of unimaginable riches glowing right in front of me. Well, pretend I didn't hear that. The chief grumbles, narrowing his eyes at me as I cover my mouth. That puts a dent in the whole noble theory for a mere case of ingots gets him this excited. Rither adds rather sternly, causing Ranok to finally flinch in my defence. I guess the wolf was equally as shocked as I spoke of as I currently am. Well, it's just a phrase. Well, he's not dumb, after all. He's just picking things up with each day. Uh, precisely. The advisor cuts Ranok off, looking at me with the same penetrative gaze I've seen before. Well, at least that's soon as mended. The chief dismisses the whole thing with a wave of his paw. I can almost feel myself on Ranok internally releasing deep sighs of relief. Ritha nods at his friend's wishes and simply regards the case of gold on the table. A thirty two bars, altogether worth, I'd say, oh, 1,300 talents. I still think it's a bit much. Chief's voice is full of concern as he reluctantly glances over the treasure. I won't say so. Perfect amount to establish credit, especially if you want to have a favourable accommodation. Hmm. Uh, very well. The old male nods and looks for his son sternly. Deposit at the town hall. The treasure will provide you with coin in turn. I spend it wisely, so I expect full accounting upon your return. In other words, don't be too frivolous. With a glance towards me with an oddly serious expression, he was implying something. Oh, I wouldn't dream of it. Ranok responds almost immediately, clearly offended at the suggestion, and his father nods, satisfied with the answer. All right, do you remember what we talked about? Yes. My wolf responds quietly, and I dart my gaze between them. So, you don't need a refresher? The chief asks, forcing a solemn shake of Ranok's head. Good, you know what to do. Well, I'll see the magistrate and secure those trade rights. You better do, otherwise we're fucked. Rither shifts uncomfortably in his chair, looking towards the pantry. With a clap of his paws, the brown male draws Trist back into the main hall. And now... He nods to the bunny, and we both look in surprise he quickly rushes back into the side room, only emerge with two sizable linen parcels. A core insists on preparing your provisions. Sure it last you two nights, in case you come up empty-handed. Well, that was very thoughtful of her. Ronak takes hold of the packages, echoing my very own sentiment. Indeed, she's very taken by you. I uh, don't disappoint her. I wouldn't dream of it. Good, that's it then. The chief rubs his paws together and chews us away. Off you go and make us all proud. 
My wolf nods and approaches the table, shutting close the chest and locking it securely with a pad. To my surprise, the box has a leather strap attached to it, which allows it to be thrown over one shoulder and carried like a side bag. My chief. Ranok takes a deep bow, then nod in slightly towards the brown male, and I decide to do the same. Aletha? We back away slowly from the hall, only turn our backs once we're in the atrium proper. Ranok stops near one of the lounges, placing down his heavy load. Well, that was a bit careless of you. He utters in a semi-harsh tone. I'm sorry, I was just taken back by it. Well, this. I point to the wooden chest and he sighs. Oh, that's fine. I didn't seem to mind. Do you think they suspect? I ask, not really sure what to make of their indifference. Oh, I don't know. But I don't think it matters now. He says in a hushed tone, looks cautiously back toward the hall. I stand awkwardly to the side, not sure what to say as he's correct in the fastening of the chest. Once he has it adjusted, he hoists the gold onto his arm again and would proceed to leave. First, I thought he might have been cross with me, but he quickly smiles back, clearly happy to be on the way. I side away until we leave the villa grounds entirely until I speak up again. No point running my mouth with the bunnies watching, especially Leaf. She's really dead set on sending me spiteful gazes. Truth be told, she reminds me of Trist in that sense. But unlike him, she has no actual reason to dislike me. So why is she staring me down so intently? In all honesty, I don't care. I have bigger problems to worry about. Right now, even they have to take a back seat. I finally get to leave this place and explore the world, even for just a little bit. Exactly like what we talked about those very first, first few days. When we veer onto the road, I take a deep, exaggerated breath. That meeting was oddly cold and abrupt. Then again, how can I blame them when that fat bitch pops up everywhere like a jack-in-a-box? Uh, what? He snorts in amusement and another word he might not understand. You know, one of those mechanical toy thingies. There's a puppet on the spring that leaps out of a box when you open it. You really are a noble. He continues to chuckle, causing me to shake my head. How are your shoes, my lord? They're all right. I wiggle my foot teasingly. The leather sole slips every now and then, but a gentle tap with the side of my foot pushes it back in place. I state, but his confused expression betrays he has no idea what I'm talking about. Anyway, I'm sorry about the slip-up. Oh, forget about it. He waves his paw at me. With everything happening, I don't think they even care. They have lots more important things to deal with. Summer in a howl isn't something we do lightly. He says in a serious tone. In fact, the last one took place when I was just a young pup. I bet they're making sure they have all their bases covered. Is it true what your father said at the feast? That if the elders removed him, Vitha would take his place? Well, I guess. The wolf shrugs in equal doubt. Well, I surprised them to speak of it so openly. Before it's simply an unspoken assumption, there really is no one else as popular or prominent as Vitha. If the Howl had to choose a replacement, it'd most likely be him. Which would mean you'd not be the heir anymore. I say that in a rather concerned tone, but he seems almost to lighten up at the prospect. Perhaps. I'm not going to lie, that would be nice. But Dreher is no leader, and even if Vitha would appoint him as his successor, Howl would never consent to it. Especially not with the current situation. A chief must have a clear successor, and both should be figures that others look up to. So, who will become chief after Vitha? Ranak falls silent, and he might as well have given me an answer. Oh, you're kind of trapped, aren't you? I mutter gently, the only sighs. We're all born with a single destiny and purpose in life, both written in the stars long before we were even conceived. No schemes and plots could undo that. I was born to rule, and even my father would be disgraced and Vitha would take over. Eventually my destiny would find a way to correct the course. It's good to hear her at peace with that. I even admire it. I nod approvingly. You do seem to be born to lead. You command respect, loyalty and devotion of those around you. Vul, Verissa, even Regara will follow you to the end. I saw the way she looked at you at the feast. Well, I'd rather not relive that, if that's okay with you. 
his head's completely deflated, almost tucking his tail in. The things Ricard admires me for are not the things I'm proud of. Which is another reason why you make a great chief. You won't be ruthless or cruel. I try to encourage him, but he doesn't seem convinced. Well, I'm glad you say that. But life is never as easy as that. And you were right yesterday. If there's something I learned this week, it's that I will do anything to protect those around me. That includes being ruthless and cruel if needs be. The wolf says in a rather cold tone, something I've never experienced from him thus far. He's serious and it's clear he's thought it through. The idea of having to become what he must become to defend his loved ones weighs heavily on him. I just place my hand on his shoulder. But can we not dwell on this? Yes, with a quivering voice and I nod. We have a long road ahead of us, and I'd rather we focused on the scenery. It's your opportunity to see Tiernan in all its glory. Oh, I don't think anything could top what I saw yesterday. That, to me, was Tiernan in all its glory. I say in a surprisingly confident and destructive tone, which even takes me aback. What? The wolf just stops and stands there, gawking me in embarrassment. I decide to continue on as if nothing happened. I'm swinging my hips side to side as if we're on a catwalk, mustering all the provocativeness in my gait I can pull off without being comical. Eventually I hear him clear his throat and rush after me. I allow his stride to bring him back to my side, and he clears his throat once again, trying to play it cool. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed the views. I wish I'd dropped the coin. It's a sight I definitely want to revisit. His stunned and flustered expression finally makes me snort and gracefully, and I begin to chuckle. If you have only seen your face. <laughs> hey. He mumbles uncomfortably. Don't make fun of me like that. Who said I'm making fun? I lean onto his arm, wrapping my arms around it. Well, the timing might have been off. I wanted you to know I was very much enjoyed anything that did or didn't happen. I find myself saying gently with a heartfelt honestly, and he smiles. So did I. He moves it through a toothy grin. You're surprisingly attractive, considering the lack of fur. My eyes open wide at this offhand compliment. One would expect a furless creature to look like a sick pup. Yeah, I get it. I cut him off rather harshly and pull away. Damn, you're getting really flat out of the window there. For a moment I really feel offended. It takes just a second of my humour to return and I laugh out loud. I didn't know you were into sick pups. No, you make it sound creepy. He takes his turn being offended and I continue to laugh. Not my fault he needed to work on your comparison game. So what would humans say for how smooth you are? We say one skin is soft as a baby's... I almost choke at a realisation. You know what? Never mind. Fuck poetic licence. Most of it ends up creepy in retrospect. Oh, with that, he laughs away, but we can t- as we continue through the next few hundred metres, just smiling and enjoying the morning stroll. The fresh air and the dewy scent of the woods really lightens up my mood. I need to keep it up. It doesn't take long for my body to start straining under the weight of all the baggage I'm carrying on my back. I won't complain. After all, Ranok is carrying God knows how much gold in that trunk. Still, the presence of such treasure fills me with slight unease. Do you think it's wise that we're travelling with all that wealth alone? Oh, what do you mean? The wolf asks, raising his brow. Don't you fear we could be ambushed, or... Well, by whom? He cuts me off and his voice takes on a more mocking tone. Our well, immediate area is patrolled by our packs, currently wolves and Barissa's wolves, but beyond the outer alphas maintain order. You're safe here. He tries to sound reassuring, but I keep looking at him with a rather unconvinced expression. If we were to be attacked, do you think some downtrodden unfortunate could beat me in combat? No. I concede through a sigh and snort at the fact that I almost sound disappointed. We're well, safe within Tien, and you have my word for it. What about beyond? The road to Strandbard is desolate and speckled with impoverished farmsteads. If you're a highwayman and you're operating there, you really don't understand the meaning of highway behind your profession's name. He states snarkily, and I can't help but laugh at his observation. True. So, how much exactly is three talents? 
I ask idly, toying with the idea of my very own price tag. Way too much. The wolf huffs, and I give him a worried look. He clearly misreads, judging by his panicked reaction. Well, not the art worth every penny, but... He sighs, rubbing his neck awkwardly. Well, that amount is something that would take a ward three years to repay. Trust on debt is set at seven talents, and he incurred it on behalf of his entire borough. Oh. I mumble awkwardly, looking to the ground while the wolf continues in a defeated tone. Oh, paying that will set me back quite a bit. I meant to use my money to pay off Trist. Uh, no, that seems quite unlikely. Well, you don't have to pay it, though, right? I ask, a bit confused by his sudden sad expression. I don't intend to run off while we're there. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. He quickly straightens up and shakes his head dismissively. I wasn't suggesting that at all, but we'll have to settle that debt eventually. Hmm. I narrow my brows. Something feels off about his erratic behaviour. I decide to let it be for now. Well, anyway, enough of that. The wolf weighs his paws at me and comes to a stop. What's the matter? Well, I wanted to show you something before we depart. He nods off trail and leads me towards the greenery. We wade through quite a thicket and try my best to brush off all the stray leaves and branches. The heavy load I carry does not make the task any easier. At least the improvised shoes come in handy, and I sally forth without a whimper, seeing Rannoch brave through with his own payload. It takes some time to push to where he wants us to go, then she stops me with a gentle pat on my shoulder. Oh, her. He says in a hushed voice that he brushes aside the last bushes with his paw. I stop dead in my tracks. With jaw dropping to my chest, I look upon his very own name tree. Oh, oh my, is that... I ask out of courtesy rather than anything else, for the chisel name in the trunk leaves no doubt what I'm actually looking at. Mm-hmm. The wolf nods, watching happily as I drop my backpack and take shaky, humble steps towards the tree. I don't know why, but I'm suddenly overtaken by a powerful emotion, almost if I could sense the spiritual link between the tree and my wolf. It fills me with the same feeling of calm as he does. Almost as if Rannoch's presence emanated from within. I dare not to touch it, stopping mere inches from the bark and lowering my gaze in reverence. That's when I notice the ground beneath it, with roots burrowing through the earth on each side. Is this where? Yes. He proceeds my question with an answer, walking up beside me. You lie to this very spot. In all fairness, seeing you standing here now feels almost surreal. It seems like a dream. I can relate to that. I smile weakly, looking at his loveful muzzle. Although I don't remember any of this, somehow I feel like I've been here before. I feel safe here and at peace. I'm glad to hear it. I feel the same, and that's why I always come here to meditate. I look back to the grass beneath my feet and crouch, reaching to the blades with my hands. For some reason I thought there'd still be blood here. I mutter, noticing nothing of the sort. Well, it's been two weeks since, and it rained, remember? He snorts, approaching me with amusement. What wasn't washed out, the animals took care of. It's so strange standing here after all that happened. It is beautiful, though, growing tall and strong, just as its namesake. Huh. I look up to the towering crown above us, and we both smile at the, at the gentle rustle of leaves. This place even smells like him. Would you mind if... I ask, gesturing towards the tree with my hand, and he shakes his head. Oh, well, not at all. First, I'm reluctant to touch it, almost like a pilgrim reluctant to touch a holy relic. Eventually, my veneration turns into a desperate need for affirmation. But when my hand connects with the hard bark, his eye is thrown down the well. I almost hear the thunderous sound of my plunge into that murky grave. Disturbed by my fall, the water grows dark and thick. All of a sudden, I'm back into nothingness. A chill runs down my body to have her laid down on ice. Breathing comes hard, and then it comes to a stop. Everything is gone, and I want to scream. I no longer have control of my body. Not again. 
Then my eyes opened, but not really. Those are not my eyes. I watched like a person in a driving theatre watches a movie. The eyes open and they see the tree, but only for a moment. Darkness claims everything once more and it takes a while until they open again. I'm almost out of breath submerged in this void. Suddenly my lungs expand as if allowed to take one desperate gust of air. I hear choking as the eyes blink in the light. I see the wolf, my wolf, standing above me. He's startled, panicked even, blood covering his paws. By the moon, you're alive? Rannock. I hear a voice utter his name. It's my voice. What? Who are you? What happened? The memory of our first encounter returns to me. He was telling the truth, not that I ever doubted him. I looked at him and uttered his name. That's when the darkness returns one last time. I'm reliving that moment almost as if the tree showed it to me and immediately reminded of the dear druid. Finally, the spell is lifted. I can hear the forest and the birds once again. I open my eyes, my own eyes this time. I can see his name carved into the bark. The first time I see it. I know I've never seen it before. I witnessed my glimpses of awareness before I woke up in the cabin. Laying there, in the grass, I couldn't have seen it. It's fate. Whatever brought me here, placed me in his care, and I knew it from the very first day. That's why I felt so oddly at peace with him. That's why we formed such a strong connection. The name is really pretty. It rolls off my tongue as if I knew it forever. I state, trying to contain the emotional torrent erupting deep inside of me. I can almost imagine you carving the name here. I mutter, tracing the action with my fingers. How did you end up with it, if you don't mind me asking? Was it your choice? Oh yes, it was. The wolf nods. What's it mean? A wolf should never reveal his pup name, nor a reason for his choice of an adult name. Seriously? I gasp in amazement at the secrecy of it all. But at the same time, carrying a few secrets of my own, I can definitely understand this. But there is a reason, right? There is. An embarrassing one, but there is. He mumbles awkwardly, shuffling the grass beneath his paws and looking away. And you're not going to tell me? Well, maybe one day, but not... Not today. I finish from with a gentle smile. I won't be the one to pry. Fine. I sigh, closing my eyes and taking a deep breath while stretching my arms out. As Marissa once told me, all good things come in time. I'm glad you brought me here. His muscle lights up and his tail wags at that comment. I continue exploring the area. What's this? He asks as I stumble across a small stone structure. It almost looks like some sort of garden lantern. Ah, oh, it's a fey shrine. He says in a slightly weary tone. My mother was a bit superstitious. She had a commission upon my birth. Superstitious? I ask, not sure what that really means for a magic weary, otherworldly wolf in society. She followed the old ways. I'm told she used to light a light here every day, asking the forest spirits to look over me. That's really sweet. I smile, clasp my hands together and look at this token of her devotion. Do you continue doing that? And what, leave an unattended fire next to my name tree? The wolf snorts dismissively. I load a small candle will burn down the forest. I will be surprised. Either way, your mom seems quite a character. I'd love to learn more about her. I say absentmindedly, only to notice Ronak's entire posture deflate. Fuck. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. No, it's fine. The wolf sighs, lowering his head in defeat. I don't have much to share, I'm afraid. Father doesn't talk about Mom. What I gathered from the others. He did one thing a wolf is never meant to do during his... Well, first time. Which is? He fell madly in love. They both did. He scoffs in amusement and I smile. 
Tremonia seemed almost obscene, but they didn't care. All they wanted is to be together. That's why she stayed so long after your birth, isn't it? And make an educated guess. Do you know what happened to her? That question seems to have really set him up into high alert, and the wolf perks up. I, I really don't want to talk about that. Sorry. No, it's me who's sorry. I should have guessed it's too personal for you to talk. Well, it's not that. Ronald cuts me off, placing his heavy paw on my shoulder and lifting my chin with the other. There's a lot of things I'd want to talk about. We only have so little time. I don't want to waste it lingering in the past, when I can enjoy the present with you. Same, to be fair. I say, stepping closer to him and snuggling into his muscular arm. Thank you again for bringing me here. I want to see this place for quite a while now. The tree is really beautiful, although a bit bigger than I expected. Oh? He looks at me with confusion and darts his gaze towards the tree. An involuntary smile appears on my face as he tilts his head in that typical canine fashion while scrutinising it. I mean, it is around 22 years old. Then again, the name trees aren't really regular trees. Apparently there's some sylvan magic involved, some remnant of the old ways. It looks me with a troubled gaze at his muddled explanation. I guess as much. I nod in agreement. I wouldn't mind learning more about that, to be fair. What, the old ways? Well, that's something you'd have to investigate without me. Why, is it not that you'll be killed if you... Oh, no, no! My tease is cut off by his frantically shaking paws. I certainly haven't got a clue about all that. My father decriminalised Sylvan practices. To the horror of the elders. I jest, he sighs heavily. Well, not exactly a laughing matter. He was nearly killed for it. What? I gasp in shock and he looks back towards the tree. It was a very unpopular move. I think he did it because Mom was a believer. One of the Alphas challenged him to a duel and lost. My father showed mercy, but the male was a bitter loser. During the fallen feast, he tried to assassinate him with a javelin. Father got pinned to his own chair. He nearly lost his life then. The scar on the chest. I conclude grasping at my lips. It's pretty much the shape and size of what a javelin wound would look like. Well, that's when Vetha rushed in and ripped the honourless traitor's throat wide open with his own fangs. Our lives a massive purge. He and Dad banished all the malcontents to the outer packs, allowing only trusted wolves to remain within the village. Is that the dirt the elders have on him? Dirt? The wolf blinks at me in confusion and I sigh internally. I guess I won't let him relax on this trip. I decide to share with him what I've overheard at the villa, the threats and the shouting sprees. To my surprise, Ronald takes it all awfully well. well. It's been like that ever since I can remember. Father's well, transition to power wasn't exactly peaceful. The assassination attempt was the last tremor of a far worse time, but... I can see him divert his gaze and nudge me into a slow gait. I really don't want to talk about politics and my past or anything other that could drag our mood down. Here. He stops for a moment to look back at the tree one last time, and I join his locked gaze with mine. Here is where my future unfolded. And finally I have it made flesh, standing beside me. What I want now is to simply look forward and enjoy the time we're given. Amen. I nod happily, almost tearing up at his sweet testimonial. I'm sorry for being such a killjoy. Well, it's fine. I've grown accustomed to your empty mind wandering off. You have lots of questions and simply want answers. There's a time and place for everything. My place right now is at your side. The time for us is to simply relax and take in our cross-country trip. I pick up our luggage and again wrap myself around his arm as we proceed to leave the place with subtle smiles. The road winds lazily through many overgrown knolls and mounds. The trees flanking the path are getting older and wilder, eager to reclaim the strip of land cutting their realm in half. Now and then my feet stumble, drawing weary gaze from the wolf. I must draw my strength not to falter. Hours go by and my resolved dwindles, stifled by the feeling of utter helplessness, as the scenery seems not to change much at all. 
Seems as if we are barely moving, but Rannoch spurs me on, giving encouragements every time I am about to surrender. The backpack weighs heavily on my shoulders. The merry clanging of the pan and pot now seems more like mockery. Why did we take all of this stuff? For each time I feel a complaint dangling at the edge of my tongue, my eyes dart to the wolf. Heavy armoured and with his massive long sword, he still carries the unnatural load of gold on his side in silence. I am not insulting by whining, so I resign myself to silent endurance. I have little strength to talk, that gives me plenty of time to think. My mind mostly strays the uncanny room I escaped tonight. The world I left behind feels now like a dream or a childish flight of fancy. But it is real, as real as the world I'm walking in right now. At least, I like to think that. The sun twinkles between the leaves of the woodland canopy, and I wish we were more out in the open. In summer this shade would provide a much-needed respite from the heat. But now, in the last cusps of winter, the harsh cold breeze serves only as a reminder of how little I'm wearing. I pull the cloak tighter around me, continue following the sun with my eyes. Shortly past noon, we stop at the side of the road, and I drop the backpack to the ground with a loud gasp of relief. The wolf looks at me with an emph- empathetic smile and hands me the water skin. I uncork it and take several deep gulps, not minding the fact that some of the cool water liquid trickles down my chin. Oh God, I needed that. I exhale, drawing a subtle chuckle from him. Well, we've covered eight miles. Is that bad or good? Well, neither this nor that. He shrugs, taking his turn with the drink. Well, we've been walking for just four hours, so... It felt like forever. I groaned, stumping down onto the ground and just looking at the dirt between my splayed feet. How far is Strandbard anyway? Well, at least eighty more miles. Rannoch snorts, looking between the food parcel we've gotten early this morning. He passes me one of the quiches and I bite into it despondently. That means you have another forty hours of continuous march. Where if you can keep up the pace? He emphasizes teasingly, taking a seat beside me. I don't find it funny. Seeing my mood remaining firmly on the downside, he bumps into my shoulder. Oh, don't worry, it'll get easier with time. We still have at least eight hours of road to cover today. Eight hours? I exclaim in horror, looking at my ragged shoes with worry. No words can describe how glad I am I've insisted on this improvised footwear. I cannot feel my legs. Oh, cheer up. He pets my cheek with one finger. For now, just try to eat and rest. You'll see. Before you know it, we'll be a setting camp. I lock my defeated gaze with a quiche and take a deep breath. He's right. I take a bite and enjoy the treat cores prepared. A crumbly crust with eggy, cheesy goodness speckled with smoked ham and chives. In all fairness, even this exhausting trip beats a nightmare I escaped a scant few hours ago. At least I have my wolf beside me. I lean onto his shoulder and we eat the food in silence, exchanging the water skin every few bites. I'm too tired to talk, and no words are needed. It's just him and me, us. And we're both simply enjoying each other's company. True to his word, the evening comes sooner than I expected. We stopped only one more time, another four hours into our journey, divided into three neat segments. On the third leg of our trek, the sky grew darker and darker with each passing step. The dim light of the day began to wane fast, and we decided to stop for the night. Well, that spot should do nicely. The wolf nods in satisfaction a little clear in just a few paces off the trail. I look around and agree without conviction. I'm not a camper, so I don't know whether this place is good or not. All I really care about is that we're finally done walking. I throw our luggage onto the ground and plop myself lazily in the grass while he removes his gear. I watch as the wolf scurries about between different bushes. He's collecting various thin and long sticks, piling them up in front of me. Well, those are for the tent. He explains, pulling out his side sword and cutting off a dry branch of a nearby tree. Once he has all he needs, he nods towards me, asking for help. Reluctantly, I get up against the wishes of every aching muscle of my body. He uses his blade to dig up a shallow hole and plays one end of the stick against it. Hold it like this. He requests, I nod while he gets another pole and mirrors it with the other one I'm supporting. When their top ends meet, the wolves accuse them with rope, 
only of creating one side of the triangular frame. Within a few minutes, the supporting structure is ready to receive the cover, and watch with satisfaction as the wolf fastens the cloth to the ground with metal pins. With the tent set up, Rannock clears a small spot, digging a shallow pit to which he deposits firewood he happened upon. Once the fire is dancing merrily, our camp is set, not thanks to me in any part. But it seems that the wolf gives me leeway on account of how exhausted I am. I scooch close to the flames, drawing as much warmth them as I can. After such an intense workout, a sudden lack of movement makes one incredibly sensitive to the slightest of breezes. Ronald takes this time to scan the surrounding area, clearly looking for something. Once he finds his query, the muzzle lightens up, and actually measures quite a long branch in his paws, trying to snap it in two. Confident that it's sturdy enough, he pulls it over the fire. My curiosity intensifies when he then rolls over a massive trunk. What's he up to? I watch Rana quite the far end of the branch into a fallen tree, and use the rolled trunk to prop it up, creating an arm from which he can suspend the iron pot. The ingenuity of this guy continues to amaze me. When he's satisfied with his contraption, he tests his paws and looks at me with a smile. So, uh, want some stew? Will I ever? I muse, very much enticed by the prospect of a hot meal. He fills the pot with the remaining water from the skin bag and sets it to boil. I'm still very much bushed, so I lean back and breathe the fresh evening air while the wolf rustles through our backpack. How are you going to make a stew when we didn't bring any ingredients with us? Oh, there's an old scouting trick to get your belly full. Rank mutters in amusement. Cora's made us some pork and leek pies. He presents me two round pastries and I look at him in confusion. How's that going to make a stew? Simple. You just dunk them in and let them dissolve. He shrugs, doing exactly as he just explained. I watch him stir the pot with a wooden spoon, breaking the pies apart while his tail swishes in content. The pastry will give it body, while the gravy and stuff in flavour. The wolf takes a quick sip, nodding in approval. Well, it's not the best thing in the world. Much better than going to night without a warm belly. I'll take your word for it. I smile, pulling him closer and leaning into his furry body. Stew takes a few moments to come around. Once it's boiling and ready, the wolf nudges me gently before I doze off. Don't mind fetching the bowls? He asks politely and I nod. With the steaming food served, we sit opposite each other and dig in with wide grins on our faces. The stew smells pretty much like the meat pies it was made of. The flavour, though a bit bland, is such a welcome sensation. In fact, I enjoy its warmth and thickness the most, and it fills the belly nicely. I spoon the last portion of the stew, my eyes venture to the speckled sky above. It feels so vast and endless, but above all, alien. I can't fend off this feeling of being stranded somewhere completely foreign. A single feature in the sky is familiar. Even the moon seems different now that I look at her closely. The vision I had the other night feels doubly cruel. Everything I knew, everything I had, is gone, most likely forever. What's the matter? The wolf nudges my shoulder, clearly noticing the shift in my mood. It's nothing, really. I just suddenly felt incredibly alone. Alone? He raises one brow challengingly and I shake my head. Sorry, it must sound silly and feel ungrateful. I cherish her company more than anything in this world. But... He amply guesses there's an asterisk and I sigh heavily. I don't want you to think I'm crazy. Well, never. He protests and the reassurance in his voice gives me the courage to say what I've meant to say for quite a while now. I don't think I'm from here. Well, of course you aren't. There are no humans in Tiernan. I shake my head again, this time in the mixture of amusement and frustration at him missing my point. I don't mean the forest, or the whole continent for that matter. You think you're from across the sea? No, I don't think I'm from this world altogether. My eyes meet his surprised gaze with determination, and at first the wolf is taken aback. I know my words to hang for a moment, eventually he sets his bowl aside. What makes you say that? The sky, among many other things, you will understand. I flash my brow, looking away in embarrassment. In truth, I'm not really sure how to even go about this verbal madness I'm about to unpack on this poor and suspecting wolf. Well, try me. 
He flashes his brows right back at me in a taunting manner. I know you see us for the most part as backward savages. Astrology is something we're intimately familiar with. It detects our calendars and helps us navigate. Astronomy. I correct him teasingly, causing the grey male to blink. What? Astrology's more like fortune-telling and stuff. Well, I know what astrology is. And it still deals with the knowledge of stars. You do realise that's pretty much most of Arissa's job, right? He teases right back and forces me to chuckle. There you go, that's better. Turn that frown upside down. My smile widens as the wolf rubs my cheek with his furry paw, banishing the frown that dawned my face just a moment ago. So, what about the sky upsets you so? I don't recognise any of it. I shrug in defeat, looking up towards the sparkling firmament. You say it's early spring. If I were truly home, world-wise, not just the place I was born in, Orion would have been clearly visible in the sky, no matter my location. Orion? It's the name of a constellation, a group of stars that... Well, I know what a constellation is. He growls playfully, rolling his eyes and returning to his meal. Sorry. The most recognisable part of Orion is his belt. Three bright, bright stars in a line, with the last one slightly off axis. It's not there. In fact, I can't even see the dippers. Well, I assume those are the most familiar stars to you. The wolf mumbles between each remaining spoonful. I was never any good with stars, but most kids were taught how to recognise the dippers, mainly because at the end of the little one you had the northern star. The northern star? It's right there. He points vaguely into a spot high above us, finally cleaning his bowl with long laps of his tongue. I allow him to finish. He seems to be quite hungry, and it was a long day of exhausting trek, after all. Once he's done, I look at him expectantly as he takes a thirsty gulp from the wineskin. That's not the northern star. At least not the one I know. Of course it is. What else would it be? It's one of the brightest stars, and the entire celestial sphere revolves around it. That's why it's so invaluable for finding your way. Yeah, I get that. That's what works for my northern star as well. But those two are not the same. Well, maybe the constellations are different because you're on the other side of the globe. This catches me by surprise. I look at him wide-eyed. Wait, you know the world is round? Okay, now you're actively trying to be insulting. He scoffs teasingly, trying to take another long swig of drink to wash down his finished meal. I shake my hands in protest. Oh, no, no! So if that's how it came across, I'm just surprised. I know. A knowledgeable savage. The wolf sneers again and I hang my head in resignation. Anyway, if you're suggesting I'm from the south, you're mistaken. How do you know? One, I vividly remember being from the northern hemisphere. Your memory's a jumbled mess. I wouldn't trust it that much if I were you. He interrupts, although he's doing more in the form of the jab, I can't even concede some merit to his way of thinking. Okay then. Two, my complexion is way off the southern part of your world. What do you mean by that? Well, I kind of skimmed your books. I understood that most of the lands down south are scorching hot deserts and rocky wastelands, savannas and jungles. Fair-skinned humans don't fare well in those areas. I state plainly. Sure, perhaps in my modern globalised world that's not exactly the case, but I doubt mass migration occurs here in their long, long far away times. People of my skin tone tend to stick to colder climates, temperate at most, Anything warmer than that, and the skin becomes tanned. Hmm. His puzzled expression makes it clear he doesn't understand what I'm saying. At the same time, I doubt he knows much about skin tones anyway. They're covered with fur head to toe. They're shielded from the sun. We, on the other hand, only have melanin. I'm definitely from the north, and this is definitely not my sky. I conclude, throwing my hands upwards in resignation. It's not just consolations, though. Some of the stuff up there is completely mental. I mean, I've never seen a red star in my life. For an unknown reason, the wolf visibly shudders at the mention of this oddity. His ears fall flat and he diverts his gaze away from where I was pointing. Well, that's the ruby eye. It's better not to pay much attention. Why? I scoff in amusement at his deflated posture. Well, it's night and never blinks. And according to legends, it belongs to the Lord of Nightmares. If you gaze at it for too long, you give him a chance to peer into your soul and find your darkest fears. That's not wolf and legend. 
Where isn't Wolven? He shakes his head, looking at me with a rather serious expression. Every creature in Avalon knows to avoid that star. If it's the first thing you see at night, it's a really bad omen. Well then, good thing it wasn't the first thing I saw. For now on, let's just pretend it doesn't exist. I smile gently, patting his poor agreement that I'm not about to mock his beliefs and customs again. That's pretty much what everyone does. Ranok nearly empties the wineskin, leaving perhaps a small gulp at the bottom of it. He passes it to me as he rubs his muzzle clean and I decide to humour him. I chug the remaining contents, and once I'm done I unseal my lips from the bag with a satisfied gasp. I know it sounds weird, but you talking about the stars kind of soothes my nerves. I wouldn't mind if you gave me a crash course. Oh, well, what now? And as my word choices catches him off guard and I chuckle. A rundown, a lesson of sorts. Of course, I'd love to. His attitude quickly changes from surprise to that of excitement. The sound of his tail taps brings a smile to my face, a look as the wolf arches backwards to look towards the sky. Well, stargazing is one of my favourite pastimes. He croons, lowering himself down to the ground and patting the spot beside him. Come, lay down next to me. It doesn't take much for me to accept the invitation, and I crawl there, gently scooching myself into his torso. Oh, comfortable? The wolf asks as I rest my head against his biceps and nod. Very well, then. As I said, that's a northern star. He points again, this time I pay careful attention without questioning any of this. It's actually the beginning of the northern fork. It goes down here and splits in two. I'm sure there's some legend attached to it. Never paid much attention when the old shaman was teaching us this stuff. I snuggle into his muscles as he laughs awkwardly, keeping my eye on his clawed finger still tracing the skies above. Well, on the right side you have the northern crown. This one I know a little better. It is said it was once a real crown made of silver leaves and diamonds, created by a powerful god as a gift to a beautiful mortal. He hoped to seduce her, but she refused his advances. She chose her own kind, and in effect death, over deity and immortality. Insulted, the god broke the crown apart, and if it had a rage, he scattered it over the sky, so that she and her descendants forever would know what they spurned. Huh, I like that. It's poetic and dramatic. I mutter in amusement, drawing his momentary attention. Human myths are also like that. Well, I'm not sure if this one's a woven myth. Or it's something we tell the pups. Why? Aren't woven myths this melodramatic? Ronald chuckles my little tease and flexes his muscles slightly. Are you kidding? You should see a woven courtship. Sparks never fail to fly. That I can believe. I let a subtle laugh and he smiles back at me. There's undeniable sexual tension in this small exchange. We both get slightly flushed, so we turn our gazes back to the sky. Here on the left you have the archer. He was set there to protect the crown so no mortal could ever claim it. See, his bow is even drawn. Huh. He trails his finger at the opposite side of the sparkling dome. That club of stars over there is called the spider web. I'm not really aware of any myth relating to it, but I'm sure there are a few. What about this one over there? I point to a glimmering collection of stars that seem almost to tease me with their beauty. Ha! Huh. What? I ask confused by a sudden laugh and now quite a telling smirk. Well, that's the great wolf. Get out. No, really. Curiously drew your attention. His continuous smoke intensifies and I blush slightly. Oh no, two of us can play this game. I lean in closer, pressing my body slightly harder against his form, and muster the most seductive whisper I possibly can. Uh, seems I have an affinity for great wolves. I could swear if all the shudder shoots through his body, at the core of the eye I can see his bulge pushed against the stitching of his pants. <laughs> Damn, he's cute when he's flustered, but I decide not to push it. Instead, I return to my neutral position, looking over the blue expanse as the wolf clears his throat. Ahem. <clears throat> anyway, it's a celestial form of the Great Spirit. Whenever he's not roaming the world, he looks upon it from up there and guards the heavens. 
Hmm, what about that bright smudge traversing the sky? Ask regarding what I seem to be their galaxy. Looks so much like the Milky Way, it almost makes me believe this might be home after all. Well, we call it the White River, and there at its centre is the House of Dawn. He points to a radiant collection of stars. Well, it's supposed to be a celestial court made of light where some believe the deserving dead go. Some, but not wolves, right? No, we firmly believe in the final darkness. I understand why some kin follow in the faith of the light. Believing that some part of them returns to the house at dawn uh, must be comforting. It sure is. I must have not really certain where I stand on religion right now. Then again, everything does point to me to be somehow reincarnated. Some don't even doubt my own conviction, especially when seeing the even star or morning star begin their journeys from there. Even star? There are true stars, brighter than the others appear in the sky. They seem to venture to and fro the House of Dawn. I'm not sure it's not the same star, really, just shown at a different time. But it is there. Is it out tonight? I look around trying to find it, but come up empty-handed. No, it doesn't always appear. The even star shows up in the evening and the morning star at dawn. They also don't move like the rest. Still as slowly rotate on the sky, they seem to be passing by. It might be a planet, then. A uh, what now? His confusion is so sudden and so surprised that I choke on a chuckle. You know, a planet, like this one. What do you mean? What's a planet? You know that the world is round, but you don't have a concept for a planet. My voice might be all torn to 9 10, but I'm still completely thrown off by his remark. Thankfully, the wolf doesn't take it too seriously and dons an equally mocking tone. Well, I'm sorry, my lord, I wasn't educated at the Tagari Academy. I only learned what's useful for my backward savage survival. Okay, knock it off. I elbow him slightly and proceed to answer his question more thoughtfully. A planet is. a world, just like this one. Well, maybe not like this one exactly. Both of them are barren and devoid of life, empty worlds floating in space. Mm hmm. He sounds unconvinced, looking up in silence until his curiosity gets the better of him. But why would it glow? It reflects the light of the sun, just like the moon does. If you look at this world from out there, it'd also shine. But instead of white, it looks like a blue marble. I can almost picture him following this up with, How do you know? But instead, the wolf falls silent, and we both gaze at the emptiness above us for a while. I think he's looking at the night sky with a different perspective now, until my suspicion is confirmed. Hmm. So you say there are other worlds out there? Yep, thousands of them with an invisible sky, and millions further beyond. Well, that's some insane stuff. His voice is filled with awe, but his gaze doesn't break from the glittering stars above. He doesn't seem to be questioning anything I tell him. It feels good to be trusted like this. Yeah. I'm used to a smile and snuggle deeper into his muscle, only to hear him snort. Not as insane as you claim to be from out there. You'd be surprised the level of insane I'm willing to entertain here. My chuckle joins his merriment. He murmurs at me teasingly. Okay, surprise me. At first, I'm not sure I would even start to explain my predicament. But I quickly realised his affinity for astronomy might be the best gateway for us reaching an understanding. The world I come from is part of a set. Mm-hmm. He croons seductively, but I simply continue. Nine planets, in fact, or eight in a planetoid of when there was a nine know-it-alls. The wolf raises his brow higher and higher with each passing word. Eventually leaves no doubt he's struggling to keep a straight muzzle. Okay, I can see your expression. I really need to know I'm not making this up. There are nine planets in the solar system. Mercury, Venus, Earth... Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. To my own surprise, naming them fills me with sudden joy and hope, almost as if saying that aloud reaffirmed my belief in what's real. I'm not insane. I remember this. Apart from Earth, none of those planets can sustain life. The closest planetary system to the solar one is Alpha Centauri. As far as we know, there are no life-sustaining planets there either. It's where my mood plummets. The dreadful realisation. This means that wherever we are, it's far beyond the world I know. 
At first we stay silent, both gazing at the endless possibilities of different worlds suspended above in the sea of darkness. The longer the silence lasts, the more unsettled I become. I look to the wolf who doesn't break his sight from the stars. Eventually I rub his chest fluff to solicit a reaction. Rannoch? You're saying... what exactly? That you're from beyond the stars? It's clear he's unable to comprehend this. Now that he vocalises the confusion, I feel even more lost to what I'm trying to communicate here. All sounds bloody mad. That's why I struggle to talk to you about this. I don't know what I'm saying. Our joint awkwardness lingers, but only for a short while. The wolf finally adjusts his position so his torso is more leaned towards me, so that he can embrace me gently. Well, I'm not saying I don't believe you, although I have to suspend my disbelief quite a lot here. He mutters uneasily. There are humans on Avalon. You know that, right? You might be just confused. Maybe you've studied myths and legends, and after whatever happened to you, they got jumbled up with your memories. It's clear he's weighing his words carefully as not to offend me. I feel bad for putting him in such an awkward situation. If I were in his shoes, I'd feel exactly the same. Well, that make more sense than you being from, what, out there? Thing is, I don't even know if it's out there. I shrug equally uncomfortably. A big-ass red star would have been quite a memorable part of my nightly stargazing sessions. The fact there are humans here makes it even more confusing. I don't blame you for struggling to understand what I'm saying. Even I can't wrap my head around this. I can't begin to imagine your torment. He brushes my cheek with his paw in a comforting manner. It's been driving me insane those last few days. I didn't know who to talk to without coming across as deranged. You're the only one I can trust. Well, thank you. I'll try my best to prove worthy of it, but... He pauses, looking back towards the sky. I'm glad you didn't speak to anyone else about this. Well, I was considering talking to Verissa. Well, Luna, I'm glad you didn't. Anyone but her. What? Why? She is a dear friend, but she's also a shaman. Lanark states heavily. The tribe's safety will always take precedence. If you tell her any of this, she would have gotten spooked and dug up some obscure scrolls and absurd legend that would paint you as something bad or foreboding. I'd rather have her stay focused on the task of protecting you without dividing her loyalties. Seems a little bit underhanded. I don't conceal how uncomfortable it makes me to hide stuff like this from her. Well, it is. I won't lie about that. But she only protected your life so far because she believes you're innocent and helpless. What you told me not only sounds mad, but incredibly dangerous. How so? Well, it's a level of arcane knowledge that approaches a magister level. I was already quite convinced you're a Tigari noble. Thanks to you. I interrupt grumpily, but ignores it. Or if they suspect you have anything to do with their Magus class, that you study the hidden arts, it would mean a death sentence for you. So far I'm facing a death sentence for merely existing. Is this isn't exactly news at this point. I'm being serious. Why? Were the other warnings just for laughs? I jest, but still look quickly derives my levity away and just shrug in defeat. I'm no mage. I don't have any magical powers. Not all mages wield raw magic. Many only possess ancient knowledge, but both are equally as dangerous. The wolf groans, closing his eyes. No mage can enter Tiernan without a royal warrant, without clearly declaring himself as such. If you be accused of being one, it would mean espionage and potentially cause a major diplomatic scandal. Sure, this could be easily verifiable. Just asking my credentials would be enough. He gives me a rather condescending look and I raise my hands. What? You honestly can't be this naive. Tigeron would deny you being a mage whether you were one or not. Who in their right mind would admit to a captured spy? Damn. He's right. World or ages apart, one thing never changes. States never admit to any wrongdoing. But with that, another thought enters my mind. One I was trying to suppress for quite a while, but it was always there. I find he sighed to voice it. Do you, do you think I am one? What? He blurts out in panic. No, I didn't mean it like that. I know, but it made me wonder. Do you think I could be one? Oh, what are you saying? 
Finally, the wolf pulls away from me, slightly startled. We both sit up, looking at each other intently. Can you just answer the question? I plead, and he finally concedes with a silent nod. No, I don't think you are. I think you're just really confused. Believe me, I have trouble understanding any of this myself. The beast folk, the woven language part. I can't even wrap my head around magic being real, but... I sigh heavily, feel for what I'm about to suggest next. That being said, what if I was a spy, a Targary spy, with his memory wiped clean, perhaps to a spell of sorts? Why would you say that? He tells his head in bewilderment, I decide to continue this wave of honesty between us. No secrets, I cannot bear to hold them on my own any longer. Sometimes I hear voices. They don't make much sense, it's a jumbled mess most of the time. It feels like someone's toying with me. I realise how this might come across, so I immediately add a correction. I don't lose control or anything, not motor skills. It's not like something's taken over, not in a possession sense at least. The deluge of words becomes more erratic as I continue, so I cut it off short with a very panicked look. For a moment, Rannock looks at me with a troubled expression. It becomes immediately apparent he's more worried about me than anything else. He takes hold of my hand and squeezes it firmly in a comforting manner. I probably shouldn't have said anything. Well, I'm glad you did. If you need help, please, let me know. Because if you don't tell me, I won't know how to help. Don't bottle things up, especially not things like this. I nod and sigh in slight relief. I'm glad to have him as a companion. He's really my anchor. I always talk of Targaryen and how my knowledge and such fits their way of life. I think it started to get to me. They use magic and a spy half as you seem to believe. What if they wipe my memory and I'm just a walking dummy? I don't think that's likely. The wolf scoffs in an oddly confident way. How do you know? Well, I probably shouldn't say this, but... He scratches his neck fluff uncomfortably, pulling his muzzle down in the process. Oh, fuck. Okay, now you're making me nervous. I take hold of his paw, which is still comforting me, looking intently into his eyes and finally causing the wolf to sigh. We did consider this already. In fact, it's our first instinct once I brought you home. What? The bandages of Rissa burned? Well, that's not the only thing she did with them. As a shaman, she's responsible for physical and spiritual safety of our people. She has ways of detecting magic and enchantments. He mutters uncomfortably, and I start to realise where this is headed. She tested your blood, and there was not a shred of arcane in it. Any spell, especially as powerful as a mind-altering one, would leave a trace behind. Whatever happened to you was purely physical. Anything that's happening to you now is psychological. No magic involved. He smiles encouragingly, but I'm still not entirely convinced. You might have studied in Tageron. In fact, of that, I'm absolutely sure. But you were not involved with any magic. That's how we got Wolf to finally shut up. There was no blood ritual, just more in the left, not a single wound on your body. The wolf finishes his awkward explanation, looks back at the stars with a worried expression. I, on the other hand, try to process this whole mess, as stunned as I was before we even started this conversation. None of it makes any sense. The more I'm trying to solve this mystery, the less I understand it. I know I cannot convince him they're not from this world. In fact, before the encounter with the other mother, I was slowly conceding it all to my imaginings. But now I know it's all real. Both places exist, and somehow I managed to bridge the gap. Even if he says it was without magic, it had to happen somehow. Ugh. Eventually I simply sigh and plop myself onto the ground, stretching my arms behind my head in the grass. Fucking weird. You are not being mad? About what? Are you being careful? I scoff teasingly. If I'd found a naked twink covered in blood on my doorstep, I'd run every fucking check possible for even considering bringing that shit inside. It kind of speaks volumes of me, now I think about it. I let myself die at my own threshold. The wolf laughs and rests himself beside me, looking at me with his kind green eyes. Oh, you're not that bad. You seem keen to help others. What makes you say that? Well, I saw it first poor with Anel. You also made two unlikely friends in a short span of time. Wool and Trist aren't very friendly. Whatever you did, it resonated with them. He pats his biceps, welcoming me to rest my head there again, an invitation I eagerly take. You're a good soul, Sam. 
I know stuff is getting messy. It must be that much harder for you to deal with when your memory is the way it is. All you need to remember is who you are. That's all that matters. The rest is garnish. Just follow the compass. The wolf pats my chest and my heart dances to his tune. <laughs> Might have messed up the situation or how abstract to that conversation. You always manage to bring me down to a place of calm. Don't think I've ever known anyone like that. Well, I'm glad to have a positive effect on your mental state. It's lovely to see him smile like this. We spend the next few moments in silence, just admiring the sky above. Eventually I begin to feel the call of Nyx, and once I yawn softly, causing Rant to take a large, exaggerated one, I decide to ask a simple question. Would you mind if we slept right here? I know we went through all this trouble to set up camp. The sky is so beautiful tonight. Of course not. You're reading my mind, Moondrop. He winks at me, pulling me into a tighter embrace. I don't say I'm going to sleep this very moment, but I'd like to just observe the stars for now. If I drift off, I hope you'll sleep well. I know I will. With you in my arms? Always. He sniggers and we both remain silent, our eyes sleepily wandering to the glimmering expanse. Somewhere out there is someone like me, slowly drifting off to sleep in an alien world in the arms of a lovable stranger. There has to be. Billions of stars with infinite possibilities. Maybe among them is my own son. Ain't no way back. Perhaps. But if that's the case, I'm happy wherever I am. Just me and my wolf, with the endless skies and nighttime canopy. See, Sam did make it back home. Just not the home you may have been thinking I was referring to at the start. But that is it for Far Beyond the World right now. There will be some more uh, next month. I know Kale's working hard on it already. So before I finish off, as always, thanks to my patrons. I very much appreciate you all. And my top tier patrons are Kartek, Cobas Vissa, Mesuksu, Dissonance, Cindy Dragowolf, Tiger Cub, Gunnar Muller, Kopi, Marcus, Lark Huskerton, Bastian, Brandon Bradford, Ida Corval, Anubis Silverwind, Brian Hall, Samuto, David Taylor, Evan King, and Grizz. So, what lies ahead in December? Well, I'll be going back to Backbone in a few days' time. I'll be a midweek video, doing some more in dystopian Vancouver next weekend. We have some Earth Vision songs happening in Ocean Avenue. I may be doing something extra before Christmas, I'm not quite sure yet. And there'll be a short little video coming up uh, either on the 23rd or Christmas Eve, depending on your time zone, just a little Christmas special thing there. And of course we'll be carrying on with stuff after Christmas. I have some time off so I'll get a few things done then. But I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, until next time, we join Howard Lotor again. Thanks for watching, and bye for now. Thank you.